afternoon, everyone. Oh, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. We'll call this meeting of February 22nd, Board of County Commissioners meeting to order. We'll begin today with an invocation from Commissioner Flowers, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by Commissioner Gerard. Please rise. As we assemble today, we give thanks, honor, and praise for being in good health, sound mind, and sound body. We are thankful for our families and thankful for the ability to govern our community. We are thankful th for all of the provisions that have been afforded to us. We are thankful for being alive. We are thankful for being healthy. We ask that for those who are less fortunate, that they receive the assistance that they need. And for those who are blessed with bounty, that they think it not robbery to provide for those who have not. We are grateful for our families who stand and support us as we travel this journey. We are thankful for the staff of the county and the other municipalities willing to put themselves on the front lines to serve their communities for the greater good. We ask that this meeting that is being held today be held with all purpose and full respect of one another. We ask that the decisions that we make be decisions that are best for all and not for few. We ask all of these things in your mighty precious name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> We'll start with our presentations this morning or this afternoon. We'll switch up the order a little bit. We'll start with item number two on the agenda, partner presentation. And we invite Mike Sutton, President and CEO of Habitat for Humanity of Pinellas and West Pasco to come forward and present. Good afternoon, Mr. Sutton. Good afternoon. Thank you. Hope everyone's doing well. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today and kind of update you a little bit on some of the work that we're doing um, <coughs> throughout the county. Um, so um, Habitat is, uh, uh, is, is having a, another record year. We, uh, through the pandemic, uh, had the opportunity to serve 70 families in 2021 with new homes uh, throughout Pinellas County. Um, and this year we're on pace to complete 75 homes. Uh, but we couldn't do that without the amazing support of, of so many people throughout our community, as well as the commission. And uh, we can't thank you all uh, enough for the continued support of, of the work that Habitat is doing. Um, we celebrated our 700th home this past year well on our way to number 800 um, and uh, uh, that's over 700 families that now have a safe decent um, and affordable place to live throughout our community um, we um, one of the ways we partner with the county is is uh, through some of the funding that's available through uh, ship um, and it's a, a program that has passed through dollars that come down from the state um, that are used for affordable housing uh, as well as for infrastructure uh, purposes um, to date, our organization has received over $3.3 million in SHIP funds from the county, um, which again has helped to complete those 730, approximately 730 homes we've completed. One of, uh, one of uh, my most proud um, moments for our organization has been some of the work that we've done in the greater Ridgecrest community. Um, and uh, we've uh, to date built seven, 67 homes throughout the Ridgecrest and Dansville communities of Pinellas County. Uh, about five years ago, um, we were approached by uh, county staff about um, going into the, uh, the, the Baskin area and, and completing some homes. And, and at the time, we had community stakeholders that told us not to. Um, and uh, despite that, um, we've been able to do a, a, some amazing work in that community. We have 18 more homes to develop throughout the Dansville and Ridgecrest community. Um, and so uh, at the end of the day, we'll have more than uh, 80 homes that uh, have been completed, again, in about a five-year time span, thanks to the support of the county. Um, one of the things we're, uh, we're really uh, looking forward to in the Ridgecrest community is partnering with the Gooden family, um, who, as you all know, Gooden Crossing a number of years ago was named after them. Um, and one of the things we really try to do when we go into various communities is to honor the legacy and the commitment from the folks that came before us. And so we recently uh, purchased some property in uh, partnership with the county 
um, that for a number of years served as kind of the, the it was called the corner, and it was really where the, um, uh, the grocery store was located, <coughs> people went to, to kind of congregate and that kind of thing. And we recently um, tore, that, tore that down and we'll be uh, replacing that structure with three affordable homes um, with three single moms. And so we're, we're really excited about, about that. Um, recently, the county made available some property to us in the Leelman community. Um, and so we will be completing 13 homes in the next few months in Leelman, um, of which 11 are brand new homes on vacant lots. And then we are rehabbing uh, two duplexes, which is pretty exciting as well. <coughs> so at Habitat, what kind of sets us apart from most, uh, most developers in, in our community is really the zero interest rate. So there's a lot of misconceptions about the program. A lot of people think we build homes and give them away. Um, the people that come to our program are some of the most hardworking people throughout our community. Um, so they have to show that they have steady income. And they also partner with us in complete sweat equity hours. And what we, um, uh, what we really feel like is the key to our program, and that's the education. So we provide them with a zero interest mortgage. There's zero down payment required. Uh, there's no private mortgage insurance. Uh, they do save up $1,000 towards uh, closing costs. We build the home to the size of the family at that time. And so um, we build two, three, four, five bedroom homes. We've done some six and some sevens. We wow. serve as the home builder, but we also serve as the loan originator and the mortgage servicer. And what we're really proud about is of the 730 homes that we've built throughout our community, we've only foreclosed on six in our history and zero homes in the last 15 years. Um, a little sample of what we build. Uh, we typically do single family home, although over the course of the next few years, uh, we will be doing some more multifamily as we get into some townhome development. But all of our homes are block construction. They're Energy Star certified. Um, they come with a warranty, obviously. We provide a garage, we landscape the homes, and then we give um, or we provide the homeowners with appliances to kind of start out. And then they're responsible for the furnishings of the home. A little sample of what is affordable for a family in our community. So here's an example. This is a real life family that came to the Habitat program. It's a family of three that was making just under $43,000 a year, um, which is at about 75% of the area median income. So Habitat serves families between 30 and 80%. So they're currently paying $1,650 a month towards rent, which represents nearly 50% of their, their uh, monthly income. But with a Habitat mortgage, um, we're able to drop that down to about 25% of their income. And that's really because of that zero interest mortgage. So um, that's really what kind of can, can make or break a family in our community. Now all of a sudden, this family has about $700, a little bit more than that to work with on a monthly basis. And through our education, we can teach them what to do with that savings. Um, here's another example of uh, at Habitat, a family um, that comes to us that can afford a home at $210,000 with a Habitat mortgage. Again, uh, their mortgage payment would be just under $900 with, with taxes and insurance. If they were out on the market looking at um, current rent rates um, uh, within low-income families, you can see that they would be paying much more than that on the rental market. So again, we really feel like with um, there's no better way to build um, wealth in, in our community and, and in our country, really, than through home ownership. And that's exactly what Habitat is doing. Um, again, our, our program, the reason it's been so successful is because of the continued investment um, by so many in our community. Um, each year when we come before you, we, we bring our tax check. And we are proud to have that again here today. So I'll introduce Sean King from our staff, Morgan Burchetti, and Camilla Gonzalez. And we're here to present the county with over a million dollars in taxes from this past year. Um, and so when we started doing this about six years ago, um, ironically, Charlie, I think you were chair at the time, um, and the check was about $375,000. And so you can see that the exponential growth of, of homes that we've built has led to more taxes back into the community. Um, and so, again, this is symbolic of the fact that the program is not free um, and the families work really hard. So, again, thank you on behalf of Habitat. Thank you. I'll come down for a photo in just a second. Are there questions or comments from the commissioners? Great job. Commissioner Flowers. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Chair, just want to say thank you to Mike Sutton and Sean King. They were not only participants with the Affordable Housing Work um, Conference, they were co-sponsors with the conference and um, 
I think really lent a lot of good information to the breakout session that mm -hmm. Mike Sutton mm -hmm. actually served on that panel. I have the photos and stuff, so I'll get them uh -oh. to you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I just wanted to say thank you so very much. There are a lot of um, Habitat um, for Humanity homes in South St. Petersburg, in my district, in my community, um, going down by the Enoch Davis Center. I think you all have kind of turned that into Habitat Row right there because it's several <laughs> Habitat homes. I was down that way Sunday and yeah. um, just drove by and took a look at them. So thank you so very much for what you do, Sean. Uh, the lady sent us another plaque because she couldn't repair it. His plaque broke. They he was sent upset us about that. <laughs> yeah, we calmed him down a little. Yeah, I, was, I thought we could yeah. fix it, but she said no, she would send another one. So it was put in the mail yesterday to us, and I'll get it to thank you. But again, thank you for what you do, um, and you are correct. Home ownership and building wealth in the community mm -hmm. is one of the true ways that we can rebuild the fabric of the community, and you see that and you understand that. So thank you so very much for what you're doing. Thank I just you, wanted to say that publicly. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Seal. I just wanted to echo um, Commissioner Flowers' comments, and I did enjoy the panel as well. Um, good information and good job. We're going to have to see again how we can streamline our streamline our process, right? <laughs> anyway, my question is: um, when um, someone gets the mortgage for their home, are they restricted for reselling it, or I, I've never? known the answer to that yeah there so everyone has the opportunity to sell their home if they choose mm -hmm. um, you know we try to counsel them on the fact that it's a zero interest mortgage and <laughs> replacement costs right now are through the roof right and so um, however um, there are some restrictions on the property there's equity share um, so uh, because of that zero interest mortgage we want to make sure that someone doesn't come into the program buy the home and turn around and flip it mm -hmm. the sweat equity typically prevents folks from doing that but um, but we do have that equity share piece. If certain funding is used, um, if we acquire some funding through the, the county or different municipalities, sometimes there's various restrictions as well on the property in terms of affordability periods. But um, if they do sell the property, do they have to um, sell it to somebody who's also needs affordable housing? Or? Depends on the affordability period. Okay. Yeah. All right. And we have first road of refusal on every home. So oh, you do? they have to come to us first and we would kind of look at the situation and figure out if you know, um, it's in Habitat's interest to rebuy the home mm -hmm. or for them to put it out on the open market. Thank you yep. very, very much. I never knew that. That's good. Further I'm questions? Thinking. That was good. I didn't know that either. Yeah. Let me come down for the photo. Yeah. Boy, we haven't done that for a long time. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got your finger down. What? <laughs> Feels like normal, but I can't believe it. One beer. One beer. And the candy on your phone. We also want to take time this month to recognize Black History Month with the proclamation. And I'd like to invite uh, the chair of the board of the Woodson Museum, uh, Ms. Frechette Bradley, if you would come forward and join me. Black History Month is an opportunity for us to commemorate and celebrate the historic and present day contributions of black Americans. The History Month originated back in the February of 1926 as a supplement to school curriculum in the U.S. You can come right around here for <laughs> by noted historian Dr. Carter G. Whitson. It was a week in February selected as the uh, birthdays of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. Later in the 1960s, it was celebrated as Black History Month through college campuses throughout the United States. And in 1976, officially recognized as a month by President Ford. 
The Woodson Museum in, in St. Petersburg has become a treasured landmark in Pinellas for preserving, presenting, and interpreting black history, for which we pause today to acknowledge their efforts with pride and gratitude. Pinellas County will continue to support efforts of inclusivity, combating racism, recognizing the contributions of black Americans to our county, state, and nation, while ensuring that all citizens are, citizens are treated with respect, equality, and dignity, and therefore be it proclaimed today by the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners that February 2022 be recognized as Black History Month. We have a proclamation and I'd like to give you the microphone and let you say share a few words with us. Thank you so very much. I am so honored. Let me grab the microphone for a second. Thank you. Thank you. I am so honored to stand before you today. Thank you so very much. Uh, Terry would not have missed this under any circumstances, with the exception of being in Tallahassee today. Because Terry, you usually see her face. She is the face of the Woodson. And she's in Tallahassee to advocate and address legislation as it relates to the museum and funding. So I stand before you as representation for our, of our board of directors and Terry Lipsy Scott, our executive director. We thank you so very much for your continued support. We ask that you join us in creating more black history as we continue to raise capital for our new state-of-the-art museum. So please, all of you, I'm glad you all ask, what is our goal? <laughs> our goal is 27 million. So please join and become a part of creating black history. And you can find that at the woodsonmuseum.org. So again, thank you so very much. Thank you. All right, we'll move to citizens to be heard. Item three on our agenda. First is Jeffrey Caputo. Come forward, introduce yourself. You'll have three minutes to address the board. Good Thank afternoon. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Jeffrey Caputo, St. Petersburg, Florida. Wanted to talk about term limits. Uh, it is a nice breath of fresh air not to have to talk about vaccines, masks, and uh, hospital capacity. <sighs> but. Um, at the expense of being sophomoric, I looked up the term democracy. And uh, direct democracy, a form of government in which the people have the authority to, to deliberate and decide legislation, it contrasts with forms of government where power is held by a small number of individuals, as in an oligarchy. Democracy is in contrast with dictatorship or tyranny in which the people can control their leaders and oust them without the need for a revolution. So the members on this board inclined towards Democratic Party ideals have a unique opportunity to show the constituency how democratic they really are, embracing every aspect of democracy, including this direct democracy premise, via a referendum to the people for term limits. With extreme left-wing, right-wing polarization these days, this referendum would be enlightening to see if all voters in this county can actually agree on a common issue. And it would be amazing to see such a referendum potentially break through this great political divide. Uh, barring the legal technicality, of the ruling against term limits, the 1996 ballot initiative showed popular support across party lines for term limits, notwithstanding the finer points of law uh, in which the Florida courts overturned it. Uh, 2013, Judge Schaefer, as you know, Judge Schaefer, he held that the ruling by the second DCA in 2003 was binding and that the 1996 referendum was unconstitutional, but any future referendums post-2013 were to be governed by the fourth DCA case of Telly versus Broward, which stated, for these reasons, we decline to extend the holding in Cook to apply to members of a county's governing body under the Florida Constitution and hold that the voters may amend a county's charter if they choose to impose term limits on county commissioners. The Florida Supreme Court upheld that precedent. We recede from Cook and the rationale it relied upon. Therefore, we hold that the term limits provided in Broward County's charter do not 
violate the Florida Constitution. So having indefinite terms creates large barriers to entry for aspiring candidates. Uh, in my opinion, an unfair election process is created in that a campaign can cost upwards of uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars just to run against a 20-year incumbent who has ran unopposed for consecutive terms or maybe a couple times has done a serious campaign. Um, and that's due to the combination of cost prohibition and name recognition over the course of decades. So it's very well known that a great majority of the voting base are not as informed as they could be. And they'll pick incumbents just because the name has been around a while, while it's likely that many votes were not really cast for any substantive issues related to the incumbent's term. Some on this board have stated that people don't want term limits, so let's put the will of the people to the test with a referendum. Jeff Maddox? Jeff Maddox? I didn't get them in a particular order. Oh, yeah. We don't I typically. I have to follow uh, Richard Griswold, who will uh, be speaking to you today about a minor edit to the uh, county's noise ordinance. Uh, technology has moved on, and when the ordinance was originally written, it was written to uh, decibels in the A level, DBA. Uh, unfortunately, uh, now with subwoofers, and amplified music, uh, we should probably, it should probably be a minute to where it includes DBC as well. For people my age, think of it in terms as your treble and your bass on your old fashioned stereo. The A is your treble and the B is your bass. And as uh, Mr. Griswold will probably tell you in a minute, I'm sure most of you have pulled up to a traffic light and a car with a subwoofer in the trunk is rattling their car in their windows and your car in your windows. Uh, this is happening now with uh, clubs. There's one particular in the county where there's a problem and there's behind it is a mobile home park and you have dozens of trailers down the row and across the street and their plates are rattling till three in the morning. Uh, so I'll let him speak on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maddox. Richard Griswold. My name's Richard Griswold, I'm from Palm Harbor. Uh, this is in reference to a noise ordinance that Mr. Uh, Maddox is discussing. In December 21, I received a lawsuit against me for reporting excessive and unnecessary noise. This is governed under Florida Constitution, Article 2, Section 7, emanating from an establishment 15, fit, 15 foot behind my house. There were, have been 37 complaints made by myself and other residents of this mobile home park. The lawsuit actually stated that it was my imagination. In rebuttal to that action, I obtained a dozen affidavits from my neighbors stating otherwise, that they're tired of the noise also. Let me emphasize, this is happening four to five days a week from 10.30 at night the three in the morning, with readings exceeding 88 decibels on the sea level. The reason I'm here now is because of Pinell I contact the Pinellas County Sheriff's Department. I've had meetings with Gulf Jeff Gulf or Bob Galteris, his Captain Garzit, Lieutenant, and now I'm dealing with the Captain Joseph Garrett, or Detective Guzman. Multiple calls have been made with the decibel meter, but they do not recognize the C variance on the A. So they can test them all at once. It's not going to register. The C also goes through buildings. It's not just the vibration actually moves through the buildings. And like Jeff said, this is the thump, thump, thump that you hear the light from the subwoofers. Right now, there is nothing in the ordinance, noise ordinance whatsoever, prohibiting it or to recognize it. Um, and, there's, and basically, what I'm wanting to do, 
I'd like to make a motion for the Pinellas, for the Pinellas County Ordinance to address the sea base also and to the documentation and for I'm supposed to give you this beforehand, but And there is, it's simply two words, two minor words to add to the change in the ordinance to let the Pinellas County Sheriff Thank you. handle the situation, this growing concern. There's nothing we can do about it unless it's put in there. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Griswold. Um, Ms. Burton, can we have staff get with Mr. Griswold after and, and uh, kind of get a better idea of what this issue is? Yes, sure. All right. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being here today. You all set? No, it won't clear. Next is David Ballard Geddes, Jr. Hi, good afternoon. David Ballard Geddes, Jr. I live on Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. On the morning of February 2nd in Tallahassee, House Representative Nick DeCagley presented House Bill 841. The following morning, February 3rd, Senator Albritton presented the identical bill now being Senate Bill 840. Senate Bill 840 incorporates residential property as being incidental and apparatant to third-party riparian development rights. Under U.S. Fish and Wildlife National Wetland Inventory Standards, residential property via their lawn irrigation establishes a resident's property as an artificially excavated, intermittently inundated riparian wetland. Senate Bill 840 artificially contrives third-party appropriation rights of residentially owned property, incorporating residential property as being apparatant to a corporate riparian development via our sprinkler system, which is now claimed as corporate property. Inadvertently, a homeowner, upon signing the reclaimed water variance application, unknowingly gives their property away for corporate riparian development, seen as the eminent domaining of both real and personal property, again in Statute 15303, Section 5. Senate Bill 840 enables a prolonged taking of title to residential property, slowly conveying residential property ensnared as being incidental to, third, to a third party's purpose. This contrived development right ultimately allows for reclaimed water to be soldiered into residential homes, replumbing a resident's home and to levy the equity from our homes to pay for such invocation as based on Dana Young's House Bill 639 in 2012. This invocation also allows individual private corporations to establish stormwater vaults to be placed under a resident's driveway for the pumping of stormwater and to levy the equity from residents' homes, again, to pay for such contrivance. Based on Statute 253.141, Senate Bill 840 is intent to levy against the equity of residential homes, establishing a fee simple title, stakeholding, undertaking the title of residentially owned property, irregardless of who holds the deed, and that's called carpet bagging. Thank you. Thank you, David. Rory King? Rory King? Be followed by Patty Sedot, Rory King. Good afternoon. If you introduce afternoon. yourself, you have three minutes to address yes, the board. I'm Rory King. I'm from St. Petersburg. I've been in touch with many of you advocating for the change, for a change in the sea pace ordinance. Um, the cha a change that I'm seeking is the uh, provision in the ordinance that limits. Take this off. The limits the disbursement of uh, funds 
um, and doesn't allow for the progressive payments that are standardly required in the construction industry, limiting the uh, payment of funds until the completion of a project. Uh, my last communication, in my last communication, I sent a sample copy of the standard industry contract that is, admit, that is uh, uh, an adoption of the Architects, Architectural Institute of America's contract that has a number of provisions in it that require inspections and professional sign-offs attesting to the completion and the quality of work that's been done prior to the uh, payment to uh, contractors. So that that actually provides for a lot of the, essentially provides for the protection that the clause in the ordinance is trying to address. Uh, so requiring these clauses uh, in the contract is one way that you can change the ordinance um, so that the program is actually viable for use. Again, allowing for the progressive payments that are required in the industry. Other ways are requiring the sign off uh, for property owners, um, stating their awareness of the risks that they're taking on, thereby alleviating any potential liability on the part of the county or any other municipality. Uh, simply changing the wording in the existing ordina ordinance to restrict the uh, wording of any payments being dispersed until the completion of the project to the final payment being dispersed, again allowing for the progressive uh, uh, payments that the construction industry requires. Uh, another solution might be uh, requiring insurance uh, on the uh, guaranteeing the project's completion on the part of either the contractor or the uh, property owner. Another one is to uh, require that uh, property owners work with bondable or bonded uh, contractors. Therefore, again, providing a protection and protect, uh, a protection from unscrupulous uh, uh, contractors or poor quality workmanship. Uh, so I just want to conclude by saying that this program has been uh, success is being successfully used around the country. Um, I believe that there are other solutions that would actually make this program viable in Pinellas County. Um, it would be a win-win for everybody involved. Thank, Thank you for, for your time, Madam Ms. King. Patty Sedote, followed by Julie Vane. Patty Sedote. Sedote, I apologize. That's Good okay. afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Well, here's my sign. You know what I'm here for. Um, the people of Pinellas County, we want justice restored back to, uh, by putting back the eight, the eight years term limit on our ballot in November. Um, let the citizens of this county vote again once, once and for all for something that was stolen from us back in 1996. It's shameful what this county has gone, gotten away with by having county commissioners on the board for 20 plus years. Shameful. And we, the citizens, aren't going to take it any longer. Why is it that the mayor, governors, congressmen, even our president of the United States has term limits? But we don't see it here. We see term limits in other county commissioners throughout the state of Florida. They have term limits. Is this board special? Well, it breathes a little bit of corruption, if you ask me. Some of us, um, some of you up here, uh, you, know, you know the system pretty well. And you're putting some bad policies as far as <clears throat> the citizens are concerned, uh, making, you're, you're putting some bad policies in place. Um, some of them would be like the pack and stack <coughs> affordable housing, um, putting that in our county. Um, we're, you're restricting our lanes with the massive transit, PSTA. Um, all of us are pretty familiar with the term reset. We need a reset with this county commissioner. And uh, we demand that, th that the same eight-year term limit is put back on the November ballot and let the citizens decide once again, return power to the people and not to government. Thank you. Julie Vane, followed by William Henderson. Julie Vane. Good afternoon. You'll have three minutes to address the board. 
Hi, everybody. Um, I'm back again. I emailed a bunch of you all, everybody, uh, last week and let you know. I'm here speaking again. I'm not going to take up the whole three minutes, but I'm here to support in support of term limits for the county commission. And I'm asking that you all go forward with a motion and a second to put term limits on the ballot for the November election so the voters of Pinellas County can once again vote and make the decision whether or not they want it, not you seven members. We'd like all the members of the county to vote. It's difficult to overstate the extent to which term limits would change the Board of County Commission, when, isn't it? They're supported by 73% of the Pinellas County voters, at least in 1996. I don't even know what the percent would be now, and I guess you all don't either, but it'd be fun to find out, wouldn't it? They're opposed primarily by incumbents, politicians, special interest groups. They depend on them. They need them for their power, for their feeling of importance, for their feeling of that they know better than anybody else and that nobody else would be able to fill in for them. Term limits would fix many of Pinellas County's most serious political problems by counterbalancing incumbent advantages and ensuring that the Board of County Commissioners <laughs> turnover, securing, I'm sorry, excuse me, I lost my place there, securing independent, an independent commission whose judgment helps to reduce the craziness that goes on. There's so much wastefulness that comes out of this county commission. When we look at the budget and how it's gone up over the years, from under a billion dollars to now what, over two billion dollars? Over two billion dollars. It's a lot of money. I feel that the Board of County Commissioners would acquire a sense of its own fragility and temporariness, possibly even coming to learn that it would gain legitimacy as an institution by doing better work on fewer tasks. So please give the voters a chance to decide. Thank you. Next up is William Henderson, to be followed by David Happy. Mr. Henderson, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman, fellow commissioners. I really appreciate the time to talk to you. I just, uh, I'm here in support of the eight years term limits as well, and uh, I'm asking you all to do the honorable thing. The men and women in this county who have voted ahead of time have told you exactly what they want. It's not a hard thing to do. It's not immoral. It's not unethical. It's not dishonorable to listen to them and do what they're asking you to do, which is eight-year term limits giving them a little accountability with you. Many of you as, you, as I've heard and as I've seen, have been here a long, long time, and you just need to go find something else to do. So listen to the people, listen to the voters, be honorable, men and women, and do what we're asking you to do, and I very much appreciate the time talking to you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. <laughs> David Happy, to be followed by Ms. Levitt Loritz. Mr. Happy, good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am here in support of an eight year term limit. When you talk about the tons of people. Hold on a second. For, that can you pause that? that you if I can, let me figure it out. Yep. I want to get attorneys weigh in on whether we're going to have outside audio. I can, I can skip it, I can recount it for you. Um, several of our county commissioners were not familiar with the fact that there was actually term limits that were voted in for this county commission. So when we say that we haven't heard from anybody, we're not familiar, then we're not listening with the people. If you take a look at the people that are here, representative of the people in Pinellas County, look at this group of people and just imagine for yourself that at least seven, if not eight of the ten, seven or eight out of ten of these people, all want term limits. This board is the poster child for why we need term limits. We will, in Pinellas County, we will have this on the ballot. It's just a question of if you guys are going to put it on the ballot or if we're going to put it on the ballot like we did last time. 
We're not ever going to, again, have a county commissioner that's taken an inflation-adjusted $2.2 million in taxpayer salary over 22 years. We have board members on this board that were, with, with all deference to your years of experience, we have board members on this board that were born before the atomic bomb was ever created. It's time for us to get some fresh ideas and some fresh blood onto the Pinellas County Board. The people are in support of this, you know that. You've heard from us now. If you didn't think you had heard from us previously, you're hearing from us now. We're going to have term limits on. Yeah, one of the proposals I heard from, I think from Commissioner Eggers was 12 years. We marginally want a few of you on here for 12 years. We did maybe accept that. Um, but we are not going to allow these 22 year long commissions, <coughs> commissioners, to sit on our payroll. We are demanding term limits. It's gonna be on the ballot. We'd like your support in making it easier for us to get it on the ballot. You can make it difficult, but you're running for re-election. Three of you are running for re-election. Listen to the people. Make a responsible decision. That's in, you know the percentage of people that support this already. Please, make it easy on us. Put term limits on the 2022 ballot. Thank you. Gisela Loritz, followed by Rocky Benzelamon. Apologize, I'm... With Hello. your names. Yeah, I'm used to that. Uh, I've been attending these meetings for well over a decade and um, more or less looking at the same faces and watching with increasing horror how you wasted more and more money on useless and destructive projects. I lived in Chicago, Manhattan, and Toronto. All once beautiful cities till they were destroyed by decades of Democrat Marxist governments. You should move there since you seem to dream of high density buildings, monster buses, and overflowing sewer systems. I think you would fit right in there. Eight is enough. We need fresh blood on this uh, county commission before you succeed with complete destruction of it. Thank you. Rocky, followed by Vincent Nowicki. Mr. Vincent Lamone, how, how close did I get? You got close. Thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, first, thank you very much for having me here, and thank you for your service to be a public servant. And. Uh, I want to talk about yesterday we just you know, uh, celebrate President Day. And one of my favorite presidents, George Washington. George Washington, he was president two terms. And after that, you know, he, he resigned. And he gave the power to the people. Because that's what we need to do. You know, when you have people involved in the government, you will have better ideas, fresh ideas. But he could be a king if he wanted to, but he didn't. He made a move, and he gave us uh, uh, an, exa an example that we all should do. Right now, the confidence in the government is 24% moving average. 76% of the population, American population, do not trust the government. And this is you. You are within that government. So what are you going to do to increase that percentage? I mean, if you look, if you have marriage and anybody has got 25% confidence in their spouse, how long is it going to last? Simple. So what are you going to do to get the people involvement and have their trust? So if you cannot do a bold and brave move as George Washington did this, you can at least accept a term limit. They will get fresh blood. And God's know we have a lot of issues coming in the future. In my career, I was a forecast analyst, and I can tell you, we have some issues. So if you don't have insight, if you don't have a vision, how are we going to fix our challenges in the future? Lead the way, coach new people, and let you know two-term limit. 
And that's where we can get people involvement. That's the only way we can get people involvement, to get involved into public service. So this is up to you. You have the time. This is the time. You can start the challenge. You can you know, take each one individual decision, not as a group. Because if you look at statistics, all the vote is always going one way. They all have to agree. Every one of you should make a decision on this own and take the lead for what George Washington did. Thank you very much, and bless you, and bless this country. Thank you for being here. Vincent uh, Nowicki, followed by Dan Tucker. Good afternoon. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, first, I would just like to say that was a beautiful invocation, Commissioner Flowers. I really loved how you said, let's make the best decisions for all and not a few. Why is this commission against giving the voters a voice? Give voters a chance to vote on term limits. Ask yourselves, who are you representing? Is this board representing or gagging the people of Pinellas County? Commissioner Justice, you have roughly about 1,600 followers on Facebook for Commissioner Justice for Pinellas. Commissioner Eggers, you have roughly about 1,400 for your political page. I applaud Commissioner Peters for having over 13,000 on her Facebook page. Uh, Pat Gerard, Commissioner Gerard, I think you may have blocked me when I tagged you in a post, so I can't see that. I'll recheck. Commissioner Seal, I couldn't see if you had a political no, okay. Uh, Commissioner Flowers, 3,100 roughly, and Commissioner Wong, 871. Collectively, this is about 20,000 people. That's a drop in the bucket when we have a population of almost a million people. I alone have over 17,000 followers between my social media. So ask yourselves, who's really representing the people of Pinellas more, this board or me, myself, and all the people that are talking to you? <coughs> No matter how smart, no matter how much experience, no matter how much knowledge we all have, I promise you, America and Pinellas County will grow and will move on and continue to be one of the best places to live. But the people of Pinellas are tired of this body with the false promises that come from this board. Communism only works in heaven where they don't need it and in hell where they already got it. That was one of my favorite quotes by Ronald Reagan, and I encourage all of you to rise above the office and join the dialogue. JFK said, the Constitution and my conscience happen to be in very close harmony. Before you all take the positions you have, you swear an oath to support, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States of America, the Constitution of the state of Florida, and then you further go on to say that I will well and faithfully perform my duties of the Pinellas County Commission. So help me God. The County Commission is supposed to consider major problems facing county government and in a manner that is consistent with the public interest. So I ask you today, all I want is a simple motion to allow voters to vote on term limits and to give them a second time to vote on this. Follow your oath do your job, and give the people a voice. Thank you for your time. Dan Tucker, followed by Michael Benjamin. Mr. Tucker. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Dan Tucker. I'm from uh, uh, Seminole, uh, living in the city, uh, just outside of the city of Seminole and unincorporated Pinellas County. Um, for eight years, I was a state committee man for the Republican Party here. And at the end of eight years, I determined that I was going to follow eight is enough. And uh, I've been here since 96 and determined that we, need, uh, we always need new, fresh faces with new ideas. Now, I was told that before I stepped down from my office was that I could hold that office for as long as I wanted because there is no term limits. And I say, yeah, but I believe N8 is enough. Now, I'm asking you to uh, do the same thing and realize that you have other people in, out of a million people in this county that can do your job. 
There's a million people, so there's plenty of people that can, that can do the, uh, the same job that you're doing, even in the same parties that you're from. It has nothing to do with party. It is totally nonpartisan, but that it brings new faces onto this board. And figure that eight years, that wouldn't even start until uh, November's election, if you put it on there, that you'd have another eight years. How many of you think you're going to be living another eight years? Well, I granted, I hope you here. all are. <laughs> <laughs> granted, I hope you all are. But it wouldn't even start until then. So I would look forward to the, the county commission uh, reinstating to, to show the fact that 1996, when 73% of Pinellas County wanted eight-year term limits for the county commission, that we actually end up with uh, eight-year term limits. And I think that, that all of you are honorable enough to do that. Uh, anything less or anything different would be uh, control, what I would consider controlled opposition. And I've had a lot of time in politics, so I know what controlled opposition really means. It means basically no, but yes, but no. In other words, it looks like you're doing a good job, but you're not. You know, you're, you're trying to get around the voters to deplete or diminish the voice of the people. Now, at 73%, obviously, it wasn't Republicans against Democrats. It wasn't Democrats against Republicans. 73% means that you've got both. It's got to be, it's both of, both the parties, both the main parties and the MPAs that are jumping in and saying, we agree that this, this board should be limited and more people should be taking their places every eight years. Um, there's plenty of professionals in this county with a million people. There's plenty of them. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you. Michael Benjamin, followed by Mike Dreiger. Michael Benjamin, yes, good afternoon. Sir. How are you doing? Great, sir. How are you? How's everybody today? Good. Um, I have a concern about the school crossing guards. This county has overlooked the danger of these people watching our children go to school. It's really, it's hurting me to see people escort children to school, but the people don't pay it no attention. Our highways have come to be a battlefield. If you ain't noticing it, there's something wrong with you. Those people who are out there crossing those children, they need to be protected. Not by law enforcement, but by y'all. Y'all are the ones who can protect those people. They're elderly. I'm an elder person. But it's sad that they have to stand there and listen to people bicker about people going to school. The thing about it is, in Largo, it's pretty smooth. Largo got them, they got their little area down tight. But the rest of the county, they're not paying y'all any attention. I hate to say it, but there's going to be a lot of deaths before this year is over with. It is. Our highways are crazy. Mike Greiger, Greiger, I apologize. Greiger. Greiger. Good afternoon. Welcome after will be John Kiefer. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. Colonel Mike Greiger, I drove up here from St. Pete Beach to be heard, and I joined with my fellow Floridians in asking for an eight-year term limit. I do that for a good reason. My experience in the U.S. military is that we don't remain there in our positions, stalled at our certain rank. We mentor others. We mentor others so that they can come up into leadership positions and they serve the citizens of the United States faithfully. I ask you to do the same. Mentor others and then serve your term and give us a vote on eight-year term limits. Thank you. Thank you, sir. John Kiefer, followed by Pastor Mac Johnson. John Kiefer? If you come forward, introduce yourself. You have three minutes to address the board. Good Sounds afternoon. Great. Commissioners, I'm John Kiefer. I live in St. Petersburg, and I'm here to speak in opposition to term limits. Um, and I want to make one quick note. Somebody said something about Marxist communists and somehow associating that with Democrats. By the way, I'm a uh, 
combat vet, Vietnam 6970 infantry. Um, I fought communists, and I take great offense on people who call Democrats, like myself, a communist. That is repulsive and disgusting, and it's a straw, it's a straw man argument. But on the, on the issue of term limits, all of you here have term limits already. Every four years, you've got to get out and tell people why you need to stay in office. So um, I look at a county commission like a board of directors. And sometimes it takes a while for board of directors uh, to get the idea of what's going on, figure out the protocols. And uh, I had a guy call me today and he said, uh, yeah, I have a problem with, uh, with, uh, t with uh, the way it's run that, and he was a 29 year old. He says, what about some 80 year old up there, uh, you know, who doesn't even know how to turn on Facebook or whatever. Well, I'm 72 and I've got 2,500 friends on Facebook. I'm on Twitter every day. I'm on Instagram. I do websites and uh, for several organizations, VFW, uh, uh, Military Officers Association. Uh, so I take offense to that as well. Um, you guys all have to get out and hit the ground every four years and get reelected. And if you're doing a great job, you're going to get voted back in. And if you're doing a terrible job, somebody's going to step in and take your place. Now, all these people that are out here talking about term limits, where were they a year ago, two years ago, five years ago? This thing uh, was supposedly uh, uh, done in 1996. Only because there's Democrats up here now that they want term limits, and that is the fact. That's what it's all about. You guys want to, these guys have term limits? Please address run, the board. Address the board, sir, please. Run and vote these guys out. Until that time, you guys are doing a great job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Pastor Johnson, followed by Rick Dumont. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Mike Johnson, 1295 Church Street. I, I just can't see how exciting I am to get a chance to come and uh, share a, a word. You know what I was thinking? I said, I got three minutes here, and these three minutes, I need to save the whole world. <laughs> and I'm going to say something. You know, when we study, you know, where we come from, and that's what, we've, that's what we're lacking today, we've uh, forsaken where we've come from in many cases, and therefore, we're doing all we're doing in our own strength and our power. Do you realize that back in the day when God first uh, had a man to go and deliver some people, it was one man, and then God gave him a partner? With those two men, God delivered all of those Israelites without one of them getting dead or hurt with two men. So I'm saying to us, here we are in this beautiful county. Thank you guys for the hard work you do. I, I so appreciate it. I've had the privilege of working with the county for a while myself <coughs> back in the day. And, uh, man, I always wonder what can I do to really be a real blessing to the county. God said, tell them about me, Jesus Christ. The answer to all of our situations and problems is Jesus Christ. He that has the Son has life. Now, the reason that's the answer is because I want to share some scripture here. And let me go ahead and share that because that's the main thing. The Bible is the word of God. And if it's not, God's a liar, a big liar. The Bible is the word of God. So if we're going to do our lives, the Bible talks about if a person is going to build a house, listen, if let the Lord build it, you're laboring in vain. So we're doing a lot of vain stuff. But I'm saying if we would get God back into this stuff, uh, we would have that foundation. And when we do stuff, we're going to do it right. Man, when I worked for the county back in the day, I tried to do stuff right because I, I feared God. And so they had a good worker when they had me. That's the way I looked at that. I say they. I'm talking about us. You know, had a good worker because I came in there to do my part for what the county called me to do. But then more than that, what God had called me to do. So... Here's the verse. It says, when the Lord passed through to strike Egypt and see the blood on the lentil and the, and the two doorposts, he will pass over the door and not let the death angel enter into the house. Now, I went off to Bible college back in the day, and, and, and they had a class called typology. And that's a lot of what we're going through today. 
a lot of things that's happening is things that happened back in Israel's day, but it's not the same as the type. The type is the blood then over the lintel to Jesus Christ who has died and shed his blood for each one of us. God passed over to us once you see Christ. Be sure you got Jesus in your life and enjoy the rest of your life every day. Make it an exciting day as you pray and as you kind of say, Lord, help me to be a county person like I ought to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. Be encouraged because God got you. Amen. Thanks. Mr. Rick Dumont, followed by Virginia Frizzle. Good Hello, afternoon. Rick Dumont. Good afternoon. Rick Dumont from uh, Tierra Verde. And I'm not here to attack anyone. I'm not here to call you any names. I'm not here for a political party. All I would like to do is that the referendum go ahead and be, the people be allowed to vote. If they vote for it, then it's, it goes through. If they don't, they don't. But I would like the people to be given the option of making that decision. So I request that you go along with the referendum. Uh, you've had one person against this so far and plenty of people for it. And as you can see how I'm dressed, I did not intend to get up here and speak. Uh, plenty of people said much better things than I can. But I would just like to request that you put the uh, referendum before the people. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Virginia Frizzle, followed by Greg Pound. Good afternoon. Make a public speaker out of me, eventually. Hi, Virginia Frizzle, 14956 Crown Drive, Largo, Florida. Hi. Here we are again to demonstrate the word no that I do not think this commission likes to hear from the citizens that supposedly voted them in, as I believe you cheated that vote, but I'm not here for that. Just like we say no to tyrannical overreach such as those unlawful mandates, we are here again and again to say a loud no, no to your flimsy idea of term limits and no to thinking that you are doing the citizens what they want is they have already told the commissioners over many years that they want eight-year term limits and that eight is enough. One a great example is Seal, who sits on the throne since appointed in 1985, and neither party has put someone to run against her because she is in there to keep the parasitic plans moving forward. She even wears her crown when she swears to uphold the Constitution that I believe that she has forgotten. What do we want? We want accountability, and the only way this has a chance is in, in term limits. And I also pray that one day we'll have voting integrity, which, we, which means to me that we have to destroy those voting machines that have no accountability either. Every politician has a control file, and the only way to save this community is term limits and eight is enough. We will only support those who say no to those who, to those who, and those who push back the most from the parasitic siphoning of humanity's freedom and resources. What you have created in the past several years is a commission we no longer trust. Eight is enough. We don't want your 12-year vote. We want our vote we already made to count right now. And Janet Long, we are responsible enough to make these decisions on our own. Also, pertaining to item 13, my opinion is no to using tax money or Pinellas for, penny for Pinellas to be used for Southwest Florida water management installation and, AMI and of, AMI, of AMI technologies, which means smart meters installed on our homes, which means more overreach, which is a loud no. Honestly, I question if you are responsible enough to be running this large community for the greater good of the citizens of Pinellas. As the founder of the Facebook Pinellas County Against Face Mask, kudos to our community for stepping up and saying no to your lies last year. And we're back for this, for, for this eight is enough. Hopefully, I lost my, oh, we lost Dr. Cho, thank goodness. We have to listen to those lies anymore. May God continue to show this community Thank how to save time. ourselves Greg from this parasitic government. Good afternoon. 
Good afternoon, Greg Pound. Isaiah 9.16 says, For it is the leaders of this people that cause them to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. Benjamin Franklin, the guy in the $100 bill, said rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. Now, the way this thing started, I went, before this whole thing started, I went, I thought I was going to the county commission meeting, and it was a workshop. And I was sitting in the room, I, I didn't go into the workshop, but I was sitting in the overflow room where you guys were meeting prior to this building here because of the um, corona stuff. And that's when I picked up, you guys were planning to change your term limits. And then I sound, went to, then I told everybody that I knew in different groups and made them aware of it. And so that's what everyone needs to go look at. You need to go look at the workshop because every one of these commissioners was in on changing term limits. Every single one of them. You go watch it. And it was a workshop. And I just sat in there for a minute then and tried to figure out what, oh, what I was going to do next because I had my whole day planned. And I work it through to come to the county commission meeting. I've been doing this for over 20 years. So what happens this past, um, this past Thursday, I'm standing down on a corner like I do. Uh, you'll see me all over Pinellas County with two signs. One says, Jesus Christ is coming soon. Are you ready? The other one, you flip it around, and it says, um, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Um, and that says right in Psalms 14.1. And these I buy online, and they're professionally made, so they look real nice. And I have a, a sheriff, um, a deputy come up, and not only him, and there's about him and nine other deputies and maybe about seven cars. And they said, um, they said uh, we got a report that you're trying to jump in front of cars going down Armerton. I said, oh, really? And, um, and you know, I talked to him and, and tried to explain to him, no, I'm not suicidal or anything along that line. But I ended up going to jail. They arrested me, took me to jail. And, um, I mean, I didn't start, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not, um, but I believe these county commissioners had a part to do with that. Like all the other things they've done to me over the years of exposing their corruption from the people that were prior to here, from Bernie McCabe to Robert Guattari to Jim Coates, the corruption they're doing to families and children, what they're doing to our community. And I've, I mean, um, James McGlennis, I've, I mean, I've been working with him way before he ever ran with the sheriff and, um, and so forth. You look at his website, exposing the corruption in the sheriff's department. And so we, we have to take back our government because these people are selling us out. I mean, they're out of control. It's about power. It's not about serving people. It's about money and power. We see it everywhere. And I mean, so we try to appeal to you. We ask you, you know, you know, you got to have some kind of a conscience, but they say a psychopath has no conscience. So it's either you guys have lost your, you, you know, I mean, something just isn't right. I mean, you guys, I mean, I mean, how many, how, I mean, you guys have been here so long. I mean, it's like, let, let some of the people in Pinellas kind of live here. Come in and serve us. People that we can trust. We don't trust you people. You're life-term politicians and you're traitors. It's that simple. That's all I have for the in-person car, in cards. We'll go to our online contributors. First on our Zoom line is Aiden Barnes. If you raise your hand in the Zoom, we'll unmute you. Hi, my name is Aiden Barnes. Um, today, I was glad to hear board members speak about Frederick Douglass. I'd like to start with a quote from him. I prefer to be true to myself, even at the hazard of incurring the ridicule of others, rather than to be false and to incur my own abhorrence. Douglass was a great American patriot, and I encourage everyone to read up on his life and legacy. Today, I'm here to speak on why we need term limits. The Board of County Commissioners, this board continually enacts progressive and far left policies without public input. For instance, the Ready for 100 um, program eliminating gas, oil and coal in Pinellas. This sudden push to take away affordable energy is leaving Pinellas residents without assurance that low cost energy will be available during the phase out. Commissioner Eggers did try to change the wording of Ready for 100, but Commissioners Long, Flowers, and Gerard strongly refused. Eliminating low-cost energy will continue pushing our expenses higher and higher as inflation is already affecting our finances. St. Petersburg was the very first city in Florida pledging to work towards this 100% clean energy. Pinellas County was one of the most progressive in the nation because there's only a handful of counties with zero emission targets. In fact, Pinellas is one of only 14 counties in the entire country when they adopt this plan, um, when they adopted the plan. In the last meeting, the board talked about how they care about people who are struggling, fi struggling financially, but this board is what contributed to financial hardship to begin with. 
the decadent spending on pet projects and raising taxes for decades are the very reasons that people cannot afford housing, energy, and groceries in Pinellas. Raising taxes affects both renters and homeowners. It's the high taxes raised time after time for decades that make living in Pinellas so unaffordable. Now this board is putting additional burdens on citizens by forcing residents to adopt their vision of reimagining Pinellas into this progressive utopia. This type of partisan politics without the say of the constituents is highly concerning. The members on this board are eliminating um, clean or er, eliminating affordable energy and implementing policies without allowing input from the more moderate board members. This pushing through issue after issue without transparency or input from the public is so detrimental. Making divisive decisions unilaterally is not what a board representative of their constituents should do. Why not first put out a survey to residents to see if they want to eliminate gas, oil, and coal before doing it? Last month, Commissioner Long did voice concerns about the impact of attempting to evacuate out of Pinellas in electric vehicles. This is a huge health and public safety issue. Pinellas County is a peninsula, and evacuation will be difficult in a major storm. One of the issues raised in that same workshop is the new infrastructure issues that will need to be addressed to accommodate electric vehicles. What happens if these vehicles run out of electricity on the highways during an evacuation? Um, this issue was raised at that meeting by Long. And she also said, how are we going to finance and pay for all these things? Thank that you for your time, Ms. Barnes. You've Thank hit your you. Three we minutes. need term limits, please. Uh, next is Eileen Posh. If you'll... All right, you should be unmuted. You'll have three minutes to address the board. Okay. So my name is Eileen Posh, and I'm from Tarpon Springs. When power is concentrated into the hands of select few commissioners who remain virtually unchallenged at the ballot box, we the people are the losers. Currently, we have a county board of commissioners where four, five out of seven have served eight or more years. One commissioner has been in office since Bill Clinton was president. That is way too long. I am advocating for terms that would limit commissioners to a term to two terms of four years each. Eight years is certainly enough. Study after study has shown that boards with term limits are far more effective than those without. New commissioners bring in new ideas and prevent the inevitable stagnation of thoughts inherent in a system without term limits. When board objectives stagnate, the people of our county all suffer. The infusion of new blood into an otherwise unchanging commission is the only solution. It also encourages new candidates to enter the election races. This is possibly the most important byproduct of term limits. Currently, most prospective candidates are intimidated by the thought of challenging an incumbent. Elections have been canceled due to the lack of a challenger. This must never happen again. As President Crover Cleveland once said, people get the kind of government they deserve, and we deserve term limits. Regarding Penny for Pinellas, the program must be redirected toward its original intent, not low-income housing capital improvement. In 1990, the voters approved a 1% sales tax that was supposed to fund projects such as bridge and road improvements, flood prevention, and park preservation. These are all noble, necessary earmarks. To date, $3 billion has been collected, not a minor sum by any measure. Voters have continued to approve this tax. However, most are unaware that the agreed-upon projects have been expanded to projects that no voter agreed to. Do the people realize that $80 million from Penny for Pinellas is earmarked for low-income housing to be spent in the next seven years? This is not what we voted for. This blatant misuse of funds is a violation of the public trust and immediate redirection of our resources is the only answer. Thank you. Next is uh, Stacy Geyer. Ms. Geyer, if you'll raise your hand, we'll unmute you. You'll have three minutes. Hello, my name is Stacy Geyer and um, I am calling in to speak in favor of term limits. Um, I did want to address the gentleman earlier who asked where all these people were before. Um, I will be honest, for me, um, I was homeschooling my children and was complacent and, and honestly not paying attention to what my government was doing. 
but over the course of watching what happened with our rights be stripped away uh, through the COVID protocols, um, it was time to pay attention, wake up, and start to speak up. Um, it's already been mentioned that over 70% of the county voted in favor of term limits. This needs to, it's, it's not, that's a, not a small number. That's a big number. As somebody mentioned earlier, that's not just all Democrats or all Republicans. That was a strong um, count, a uh, look at our whole county. Um, there are, I called them before and I, I had mentioned that there are so many benefits to having term limits, including upholding public trust, which is definitely needed after the mismanagement of COVID-19. And this board's unwillingness to look at credible scientists and doctors who opposed what was being pushed by a few doctors and scientists who we now know benefited from the way the pandemic was handled. Um, I also, I know um, Frederick Douglas, Douglas was quoted before. Um, he also said, the limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppose. Our county is building up endurance and speaking out against what feels like tyranny to us. You want to talk about building up trust in our community, you can build up the trust in our community by incorporating eight-year term limits. Term limits also undercut dictatorships. They brought in thinking, expand constituency involvement, signal openness, lessen burnout, and thin the dead wood from our county commissioners. We also need to do an audit on the 2020 election. Through a look at voter registration trends and canvassing, there were many irregularities that should be further investigated. If the sport is truly concerned with making sure there is trust in the community, you all should be willing to further investigate why there are so many irregularities. I encourage all of you to look at electionfraud20.org where you can look specifically at the election analysis of the irregularities of our voter rolls for the state and county. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, next is uh, Barb Hazelden by phone. Ms. Hazelden, if you'll... You should have be unmuted. You'll have three minutes to address the board. Ms. Hazelden, you have three minutes to address the board. Should be unmuted now. Ms. Hazelden, final call. I see you on my screen. You're unmuted on my screen, but we don't hear you. All right, sorry, Ms. Hazelden, we'll have to move on. That is all the public speakers I have for citizens to be heard. We'll now move on to the consent agenda, consent agenda items four through 15. Uh, we'll remove item 13. We have a public speaker for that item. Are there any other items to be removed? Approval. I'll second the consent agenda. We have a motion by Commissioner Long, second by <coughs> Commissioner Flowers. We're going to do a voice vote on the consent agenda today um, it, for all consent except for item 13. Is there discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Show that passes. Item 13. Uh, Mr. Ballard, David Ballard Geddes, Jr., if you're still in the room, please come forward. Maybe we should have done that before. You see him? Hello. Do we have anyone in the overflow room still? Thank you. We'll give him a second. A little bit about it when he made his comments. Mm -hmm. He filled out two cards, so I want to give him the opportunity. Agreed. Agreed. Take this minute to make sure you've joined the meeting on Granicus, please. 
I brought my laptop in for them to look at. Apologize. Good afternoon. Oh, no. You'll have three minutes. This is item 13. Agenda item 13. Um, <laughs> Supreme Court case 96332 was the court case that ratified the reclaimed water bonds. Now, in that court case, they said that the court case, by the way, was defective entirely on every measure. But regardless <laughs> of that, within the court case, it said that we had unlimited use to reclaimed water. Now, today, a decade later, they're starting to implement, well, we think we need a meter of reclaimed water and start charging per volume of use of reclaimed water, which in light of the court case that ratified the bonds, um, it, the, there seems to be a miscommunication or possibly somebody deliberately lied on that case knowing that good and well in the future they were going to meter that water. Um, I call it into question. Thank you. Thank you, David. Appreciate your time. Are there questions or is a motion to approve item 13? No, approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Long, second by Commissioner Gerard. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Show it passes aye. unanimously. We're not doing that. We're going to go on the regular agenda. When we take something off the consent, oh. it creates problems with the system. Okay. That's about as simple as I can say it, right? Yeah. <laughs> when, you, when you do pull an item, you are able to do the e-voting on it. It's just the collection of items where you do a voice vote on it. Okay. Yeah. So I was right, but reverse it. We'll move on to the regular agenda. Item number 16, Mr. Administrator, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Item number 16 and 17 are companion items. The first is a ranking of firms with creative contractors for construction manager um, at risk <coughs> services pertaining to the jail security and entry center project. This is item 16. Okay. Item 16, are there questions or is there a motion? I move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Flower, second by Commissioner Long. Commissioner Seal. I just wanted to note that in the budget that um, they mentioned that we have insufficient funds that will have to be addressed next year. The project was originally only $7 million, mm -hmm. and now it's going to be at least 12 so about mm -hmm. $6 million more will have to be um, looked for within our other penny projects. As we're finding with a lot of our construction projects. Unfortunately, Commissioner Eggers. Uh, yeah, I wanted to make that same observation. It's it clearly a, 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 a question mm -hmm. of priorities, um, and frankly, I think at, at our workshop we had a number of us, or at least I certainly, I'll speak for myself again, that that wanted to get out and take a look at the site and take a look at what, what is going on out there and how the operation flows currently versus how it would flow, um, unless this is like super critical, and I think it is a big dollar item that we're talking about. I know this item itself is just for the <coughs> design work, but at the same time, it'd be nice to at least have some opportunity to see how it, it's affecting our, our penny priorities, mm -hmm. as well as just to get out and take a look at the, the quote, lay of the land. Uh, so that's just my thought. I, I prefer to hold off on this until at least the next meeting so we have time to get out there and look. Thank you. And I know I'm scheduled to it's I'm go scheduled on Monday. Sometime yeah. in the next week or so. So I am too. I just I Mr. Chair, I just yes, pressed my little button here, but um I too received a um response and um will go out, but I do think that based on the information that was provided to us along with the offering that was made for us to have a conversation with um the sheriff's office, not that conversation to occur at our workshop. Um, because there may be certain things that could not be said publicly as related to the safety and security measures that this would afford. Um, I feel comfortable in supporting this at this point in time. I believe what you all have done in the past and what we'll do in the future is continue to look at prioritization of our penny projects, and sometimes that, in fact, means prioritizing or reprioritizing some of those um, projects. So um, I feel comfortable in voting um, for this, and I'm sure that um, just like what we did with body cameras and the, the importance of that and others, um, we will make sure that we address the financial shortfall. And I don't believe that this for shortfall, financial shortfall is as a result of um, not doing the homework that's required. I just believe it's as a result of uh, the supply chain um, issues that everyone is having. I also believe it's as a result of um, some of the costs overhead that um, all construction projects, whether it's homes or, or 
roadways, sidewalks. It doesn't matter. Um, everything has increased in cost, and so unfortunately, um, construction projects of this size and nature that require some additional safety measures just cost more. Not denouncing anything that my colleagues have said, just sharing. Commissioner Long? Yes, and I would like to uh, comment for the record that I totally agree with everything that Commissioner Flowers just said. And I would also like to point out that in the backup material, <clears throat> this is phase one that we're talking about, number one. Number two, it's going to take two years approximately to finish phase one. And so I do think that that delaying anything as it relates to this project is almost a guarantee that cost will go up even further. So I am totally prepared based on everything I've learned, the conversations I've had, and the tour that I am about to take, that it's been very well vetted and I would like to move it forward. Further discussion? Um, so, so I'm assuming that there, there's nobody that wants to entertain a motion or just a, a, an amendment to delay the vote till the March 8th meeting. Is that the next meeting? Eight, March 8th meeting, uh, giving us a little bit more time to kind of put our arms around this. I certainly don't want to you know, say that I'm for or against it yet. Um, I tend to like everything I'm hearing about it, but I don't see there's, if it's a two-year project for, for phase one, which is, um, you know, and, and almost $800,000 for design, that if we chose to go in a different direction um, from a priority standpoint, um, it, it might be considered a waste of money. I just would like to wait uh, until March 8th if my colleagues would be so patient. Commissioner Gerard. Yeah, I I agree, actually. I think uh, mm -hmm. everybody's been trying to set up these meetings to go out there and look, and we can't. I think they assumed that we could all go out there together, but we can't. <laughs> so now he has to set up six or seven meetings. Um, I don't think it's going to hurt anything to wait two weeks. So. Mr. Chair, um, um, Mr. Administrator, what does that do with the timeline for creative? Um, I'm looking back to staff, but uh, Joe, can you address that? From a contract standpoint. Josh Becker. Joe Rural with Administrative Services. It's a two phase project. The first phase is awarding to Creative simply to price the project. That takes about eight to ten months. And of course, it has to be designed first. So that's the first phase. Second phase is the actual construction, which will take about a year. So, total, it's an almost a two year project. But the construction will not start for quite, quite some time. So, that, anyway. yes, ma'am. Thank you for saying that, Joe, because that leads me to ask, is it in, in that first phase that they will demolish those buildings out there? No, no, that will actually happen during the construction process, Commissioner. Yeah. By two phases, what we mean is that from an award process, is two phases. So the first phase, you're awarding a, a contract to Creative to price the project after our design firm designs it. The second phase will come back with a guaranteed maximum price to actually construct it. So it's a two-phase award process. What I didn't hear was sense. like, uh, sorry. What, is, what is kind it, of obstacle is this to the progress of the project? Well, uh, you know, it's it is a major security project that no. we've. Is there is there the, a the, problem with the, the delay, delay for the two no, weeks? No, I don't think delaying a two weeks is going to be an issue at this point in time. To be totally honest with that you, was my I think question. we've waited. Yeah, we've waited. You know, quite a while. I think two more weeks is going <laughs> to. It's been seven years. Yeah. <laughs> I obviously can't imagine that we're all going to go out there and look at it and come up with different designs, but I think it's only <laughs> fair that we be allowed to look at it before we vote on it. So. All right, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Um, the maker of the motion, what is your wish? I'll rescind my second um, after I had the response. Um, because typically a two-week delay in any construction project really means a six-month delay in a construction project. But since you've indicated that that would have no bearing on the um, time frame for this project, um, I will say, though, that I'm expecting for it to come back in March on that agenda and that we vote for it and just move forward. Um, and the other thing I want to say, and this is not a pun at anybody, but when we get our agenda, we see what's on the agenda. So. If we have questions or concerns about the feasibility, the construction apparatus, time frame, or anything like that, we can always go out in advance. We don't have to wait for it to come before workshop before we inquire. Again, no pun at anybody, but um, I'll go ahead and rescind um, my second, if you will, so that. I will. 
All right, we're back at the beginning. Is there a motion? Do we need to continue this? Is that what we're doing? To a date, mm -hmm. sir. To continue this to March, March 8th. 8th. Can you do that 16 and 17? I'll so second date certain. and 17. So the, yeah, she just March gave 8th. the date certain, March 8th. I'll second that. We have a motion from Commissioner Gerard, second by Commissioner Flowers. May I make a comment? Absolutely. Um, also, by the March 8th meeting, um, I think it would be good to identify if something's going to be affected by the penny for Pinellas mm. additional it funding. Well, you, you, can't, you can't really do that. We've got a 10-year window of projects. And so as these projects come up, we design them. You know, and we get that final design. That's when we get the pricing. Um, so this is a, um, a, was a penny project. It was planned for. And so we're recommending moving it forward. As we get further along, there are other projects we may not be able to get to, but we won't know that at this time. It's extra five million based on what was originally six. Six million. On and and you've seen uh, everything. I just asked from, the question: yeah. Is it? It's an extra six million on a thirteen for a thirteen million dollar project. Right. Is that what I mean? I mean is, it, is that correct? Yeah. With design, it's really dependent upon the final design. Mm -hmm. And there, but again, you got it. Some of this you got to look at the scope. Like, so, for instance, I don't, I can't tell you whether the original scope included removal of the buildings that are out there. No, um, I doubt they did. No, it didn't. Um, but it really needs to clean up that campus. And so, the there's a few. So it's it's also scope. Yeah, the original scope did not, like Barry just said, include the demolition of several structures. That adds about a million dollars to the overall project, give or take. All right, we have a motion and a second to reschedule for time certain on items 16 and 17. The clerk will open the board and members will proceed to vote. <coughs> this motion to postpone oh. to, to a date certain. So. Yeah, if you look on there, it says motion to continue under the text of the item. Right. Well. <laughs> Commissioner Flowers can't do what don't pop up. <laughs> hey, refreshing your... I did. It's, I did it twice. Mine finally pulled up. <laughs> mm. I did twice. And like to do a voice vote? Yes. The item passes unanimously. Mr. Chair. Yes, ma'am. I'd just like to say something in reference to that. I think we need to be really careful about expanding scope when we're working on these projects because we have a lot of people out there counting on us doing the things that were in the penny and if we continue to expand the scope on every project, we're going to have a, a real problem. That's all. That's all. I, I completely agree. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> I, I, and we and we do, we fight scope creep um, on scope any creep. of these projects. Um, I think a tour will will help clarify some of those issues. Okay. All right. Uh, item 18, Mr. Administrator. This is a resolution expressing support for a project as a qualified applicant for tax ex uh, ex exemption from the economic development um, process. And I think you, uh, you've received an individual briefing on this. Questions or a motion? Mr. Chair, I just have a comment I'd like to make. If I may, please. Yes, ma'am. I would like to really t uh, take a moment to thank Dr. Johnson for taking her time to share a review of how the development ad valorem tax exemption really works. And though, you know, you, we've all dealt with that for as long as we've been on the county commission, it was just really lovely to hear her go through from A to Z and just verify that we all were really on the same page. I really, really appreciated that. So if the staff would let her know, because I don't. Oh, hey, there you are. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't back there. For the, Commissioner Peters. Yeah, um, I'm going to support it, and I appreciate uh, Dr. Johnson calling me and telling me how important this was, but my concern with this one is that it's 20 jobs, and they're not high wage. They're $38,000, and I didn't think this is what we're getting into. Now, she's kind of explained to me kind of how, you know, what long-term impacts are going to be, but I, I, I really don't know that I want to see these kind of projects anymore that are low wage. The whole process was to bring high wage. Um, she's got my support on this one. She helped me understand it really well, but in the future, I'd rather see higher wage 
mm -hmm. jobs than this one. This one doesn't excite me as much. Um, so in the future, please, um, I would just, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Seal. And I concur with Commissioner uh, Peters. I, um, we really did want to set this up as a, and we've been trying to create high wage jobs for some years and to have one, even though it's in a brownfield, be it only 75% is distressing to me of our average wage. So I realize that this is still up for negotiation. Um, I've, I've been ambivalent whether I could support this or not I, um, because I just, that was the intent of the ad valorem relief was to, um, to create those high wage jobs. So, um, so I realize that this is only the negotiation stage, but we've also, I don't know who the company is, but I also understand that we've helped them before like three separate times. And it's at what point do you keep going back to the well? Oh. So do we want to ask Dr. And, and Dr. Johnson did a great job of also, I appreciated her time um, going through all of this with me as well, but it is a confidential applicant at this point. Dr. Johnson, if you'd like to say a few words on the project. Yeah, well, uh, Cynthia Johnson, Economic Development. Um, I have uh, spoken with everyone regarding this project and this is a great corporate citizen that really looks to increase the wage and the skill sets of their employees. They have um, worked with our office on three other occasions to uh, qualify for some qualified targeted industry training. So they are known for increasing the skill level. And as noted by Commissioner Seal, it is in the brownfield. It is an opportunity for us to create some more jobs in a community that really needs it. Questions, further discussion, or a motion? Move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Long, second by Commissioner Flowers. If the clerk will open the board, members will proceed to vote. Well, go negotiate. <laughs> <laughs> Work your <So>. magic. <laughs> Commissioner Eggers and Flowers. Uh, Voice vote of yes. Oh, shoot. And the item passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Item 19. This is Advantage house, uh, Pinellas Housing Compact to create a coordinated approach to housing affordable affordability. This uh, compact this is, is with all of our partners in um, Ford Pinellas, St. Petersburg, Clearwater, Largo, and Pinellas Park. Uh, provides for a um, initiative, a compact around initiatives for a housing action plan, regulatory co co toolkit on best practices, creating corridor planning strategies, addressing housing inequities, and providing diverse housing types among different needs. And this compact's been worked on, was part of our housing, overall housing strategies, and um, all the partners have come together to deliver on the compact. And staff is available should you have further questions. Questions or a motion? Just a quick question. Commissioner Eggers. Uh, <clears throat> Barry, uh, I, I want to make sure that I'm clear on this. Uh, small a affordable housing to me also includes workforce housing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the whole spectrum of housing that would be available to folks that are Quick. up to 100 and what, 40 percent of? Yeah. percent. But what this does is it brings everybody together to where they're working collaboratively on strategies to address all of the different housing types. Mm -hmm. And Evan is here. Thank you. Good. Commissioner Gerard? Yeah, I just think this um, will be helpful not just in developing workforce housing, but if we could do it right, perhaps projects of all different kinds. You know, if we can actually streamline some of these, pro some of these processes, um, I think it'll even help developers of marketplace or, mar yeah, market rents. Um, it just seems like a great thing. I think it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of energy for people to actually come to consensus on how to do this. But there's some we heard about at the affordable housing conference that uh, Commissioner Flowers put on some very interesting ideas about mm -hmm. different things that we could adopt across governments to kind of make it easier for developers to move around in this county without having to figure out a whole new set of regulations everywhere they go. And 
Believe me, we hear about it all the time. Um, <laughs> sure <you laughs> just do. in case you don't. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think it could be really helpful. I'm hoping we can do it quickly. Thank you, Commissioner Peters. Um, yeah, and I know this is premature, Barry, because we talked about it recently, but kind of that, and I, I like that we're doing all this, but this idea that how do we know who's going into this affordable housing and how is it coordinated and, you know, so I know that's not part of this, correct? That is not part of this? Correct. Okay. But, 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 it, but re having a regulatory tool toolkit shared messaging it goes back to what you were what you were saying and, and what Commissioner Peters is discussing is right now how do you even find units because these are privately controlled right. Right. you know privately built and then they have affordability requirements but there's not like one place you can go that says here's how you you know what here's how to, how to apply here's units that are and we've talked about that as staff that is something that we can we can work on with our partners on best ways to address that and um, and making those connections. Okay, I just wanted you to kind of bring that up because, you know, um, we know teachers need a place to be able to afford if we want them to teach here. And we know nurses need a place that they can afford if we want them to work here. Um, and so I think that's really an important part as we keep on voting for all this stuff, that piece is missing and I just appreciate that you're gonna work on it and I just thought it was worth bringing it up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, just one question. I'm noting the cities that are involved in this compact, I, and I know of several cities, and uh, Dunedin being one of them that has some interest in this kind of thing, and all of the other cities that aren't including, uh, included in this, how are they going to have a seat at the table for this? Baby? We're going to roll this out countywide. <laughs> so we, we've brought the major partners together to get the sign on and get the compact going, um, and then we're going to roll it out to all the other cities that want to participate. Thank you. All right, we have one public speaker, uh, Sean King. Please come forward, introduce yourself. You'll have three minutes to address the board on item 19. <laughs> Good afternoon, pleasure seeing everybody again. Sean King with Habitat for Humanity, Pinellas West Pasco Counties. Um, we're here to support this initiative. Typically, uh, we are not in favor of uh, more government in this process, especially the housing process, to Commissioner Gerard's point. Um, I think any way we can look to do countywide frameworks to streamline to provide best practices um, I think getting the stakeholders in the room to talk um, it's frustrating to go from housing department to housing department to housing department to building department to building department to building department over and over so hopefully this will streamline I would give a suggestion if we could just yeah get the same paperwork that would be helpful um, and kind of do that, uh, but we are we are supportive. Thank you for the county uh, for leading the the initiative. I know Evan Johnson has done a lot of work. We've supported behind the scenes um, and and advocating for the municipalities to sign on. We will do that again um, for the other municipalities that are not a signator right now. Uh, but hopefully, it probably will be a long road. Um, to get everybody in the room. We understand that, but I think the outcome of this, if we can streamline some processes and, and get some coordination between each municipality, um, it should not be necessarily one set of rules on the, the east side of the road versus the west side of the road, when, especially when you're dealing with affordable housing. Uh, so I think this will help that process, and we thank the county, uh, and we're supportive of this. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. King. Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, I just, and again, thank you. Uh, no specific question, but I appreciate your comments. Um, it'll be an, a, a good, I, I'm just going to call it, for lack of a better term, a pilot that can be applied to other areas, and that's just, not just affordable housing. I know we're trying to come, we're trying to do some real good work in our building department, and, and, um, and I know that each city has their own set of rules and their own set of uh, development guidelines, but that's what makes it difficult sometimes to do business in Pinellas County. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how we all communicate and, and try to streamline that can be used in other areas as well. So thank you, mm -hmm. appreciate your being here. Charlie. Commissioner Gerard. Yeah, I know that, um, Sean, you said that Habitat has been involved behind the scenes. Are we gonna have developers and such involved all along the way as we put this thing together? I mean, as, I would hate to think that it was just gonna be governmental agencies sitting around trying to decide what you need. <laughs> <laughs> we do that too much, uh, I think. Above my pay grade. Yeah. yeah. Um, ab absolutely. I think this was, this was our uh, 
our big first push is to get the main partners. And, and the reason why we pick the main ones is population, their entitlement communities, they you know, receive SHIP or S, uh, CDBG. Um, but once we get those main partners on, we really, I, I, it needs to be an economic development approach. It needs to, we need to get those folks involved, Dr. Johnson and her team. Um, and we need to get the development community more involved. Um, I will say that, at least from the county's perspective, for unincorporated county, we do have, you know, a development group that kind of reviews code changes and things like that. So all that will be moving, you know, through those types of groups, um, as well as our affordable housing committee. So there is kind of that representation there, but it's, it is definitely something we will be doing. Okay. Commissioner Long. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, I was curious of whether or not we had thought about, and I don't know, maybe Barbara's department comes into this, but uh, working through our local chambers and different civic organizations, because it's great that we have our municipalities and, mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me, everyone coming together, but how does the end user, I think that might be what Commissioner Peters was alluding to, all those teachers sure. and firefighters and police officers and folks that are getting out of school and starting their families, you know, how do they know that this is available and what is the go-to organization to provide them with the answers that they need in order to move forward with their own lives? I mean, I think that's really critical if we're really serious about pulling all this together. Absolutely, and what we've, we have been working for kind of that joint messaging and education. Um, one of the things that we have been working on for Pinellas is, this is called the Advantage Pinellas Housing Compact, so we're trying to put it under this umbrella of what Advantage Pinellas is, which looks at transportation, housing, and everything else. So we have put a new website together um, you can go to advantagepanels.org and you can hit click on housing and you'll get there. Um, it is, that is going to be our portal. Um, there's a developer's link there. There's a residence link for people who are interested in finding information. And, but our goal is not to necessarily, that's not a county website. Um, it's really, we want to make it a conduit for folks to be able to go to, oh, okay, this is where I find out about St. Pete stuff. This is where I find out about Largos, et cetera, et cetera, because that's one of the problems. We have all these different housing departments. We have all these different zoning uh, departments and so forth. And, and it is hard to navigate for anyone who doesn't have to navigate it all the time. So to your point, you know, workforce housing, how do, I wouldn't even know where to look. And we're trying to make that the portal using our communications and forward Pinellas to really kind of beat that message home. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Further questions, discussions, or is there a motion? Bill of approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Long, second by Commissioner Gerard. The clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. My voice folder is yes. I did. Yeah. I have twice. But see, this thing keeps Commissioner spinning. Flowers votes yes. Yep. See, it keeps spinning. Chief and the item yes. passes yeah. unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Item number 20. It moves. The 2022 Wheaton Island um, Preserve Management Plan uh, update as required by the two leases with the mm -hmm. state of Florida. He was sitting in the office. Oh my God. Commissioner Seal. And um, so um, at our work session the other day, we talked about with the increase in the parks budget that there will be more full time, more Wheaton Island Education Center updates and so on. That's correct. But we didn't hear anything specific. I, I said that I thought that that's what it did, and I asked Jill before the meeting, and she said that is what it did. So we, we added, what, two staff? Two staff, and so now they can provide the, the education. They can go back to the way they were operating. They can go back to, because right now they're open Thursday through Saturday and then Sunday, um, and then Notice it was, it was interesting. Botanical Gardens is open daily. Heritage Village is Wednesday through Saturday. Brooker Creek Education Center is Thursday through Saturday and Sunday, like Whedon. And the rest of our parks are open seven days a week. And, so. and what does this provide in terms of is it seven day a week or five day? It's actually staggered. So we added two in the past fiscal year. We're scheduled to add two more next year. And when at that point in time, we will be seven days. We will be seven days. Yeah. But not so they'll until, be back to being more full time. Right. But it's a sta it, we've staggered the implementation over multiple fiscal years. Okay. So yeah. this year we added two that'll yes. be addressing and Brooker and Wheaton. 
No, we had a two for Whedon. Oh, two for year. Whedon. Yeah. Okay. So we're, we're back. So, I don't but are know they the exact time? number. They are. And I don't know the exact number of hours. I'll need to follow up okay. with you for that. All um, right. But we'll get you exactly what the two that we did in 21 um, brought us to in terms of days open and hours and what 23 will do. Okay. Thanks. I think there are seven, currently seven park ranger positions open and available on the website in Pinellas County if you know someone who's looking for a job. <laughs> nice. Further questions? Or is there a motion? Of approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Long, second by Commissioner Gerard. Clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. It popped up. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Don't you? <laughs> and it passes unanimously. Item 21. This is to declare a portion of a fee-owned county property a surplus and grant authorization to exchange it for a property. Uh, this is uh, associated with the North Highland Avenue project. Questions or is there a motion? Of approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Long, second by Commissioner Eggers. The clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. And the item passes unanimously. Item 22. And this is a road transfer interlocal agreement with the city of Clearwater. Commissioner Seal. Um, yes, I was just curious because, well, one of them was my old neighborhood, <laughs> and it used to be an incorporated enclave. And so um, the road transfers, are they creating automatic annexation efforts, or are these already pretty much within the city? Uh, Kelly Hammerlevy, Public Works Director, these are already in the city and what we're really doing is largely cleaning cleaning up. The city has already been maintaining these roads, but this paperwork just kind of finalizes that agreement um, with the exception of a, a few of them like um, Enterprise between Maine and Countryside, but most of those neighborhoods are all clear water and they've been doing the road maintenance for quite some time. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, other questions? Just Commissioner with, Eggers. Yeah, just, uh, Kelly, I'm assuming by the what you just said that most all of the residents that are in, already know who to call if there's issues with maintenance so because I was thinking if this is all kind of new who's going to be notifying these folks of their point of contact versus the old point of contact so you're saying they've already transitioned into that yeah these 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 roads on Clearwater and the county have a really good relationship when it comes to road roadway maintenance and these areas yeah have been maintained by the city for largely for quite some time with the exception of a couple of those collectors okay, thank so you. sure Further questions, discussion, or is there a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Commissioner Egger, second by Commissioner Long. Clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. And it passes unanimously. Item 23. This is the third amendment with, uh, to the agreement with the Forestry Company for the ecosystem management pertaining to Albar and Crossbar ranches. Um, Megan gave you a pretty detailed email regarding what was going on out there. So <laughs> she's here, and we'd ask you to answer any of your questions. We have a public speaker, uh, Mr. Don Curtis. If you come forward, introduce yourself. You'll have three minutes to address the board. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hey. I'm really not here to give you any comments other than I'm the president of the forestry company. Oh. This property's in better shape than it was four years ago. Nice to and hear I would that. invite any of you to come out. We'll give you a custom tour. We understand you have to come out individually, right. but that's okay. Uh, we would really like to show you some of the things going on out there. But I'm, I'm here to hear the primarily to answer are doing questions. So much better. <clears throat> and also, <laughs> Our work out there with your forest is the first start to your net zero for 2050. On the way over here, I was talking with the National Carbon Exchange to generate interest in seeing what we could do on your property to sell carbon credits in the future and things like that. So the future starts today, particularly with forests. It's a long-term proposition. So any questions? Questions for Mr. Curtis. Commissioner Long. I, I guess I'm kind of curious just because I was so stunned when I had the opportunity to tour that property. It was quite a few years ago. I'd like to do it again just to see what you've done that's different from the way it was. What did you encounter that was your, your biggest obstacle to overcome to make it the way you wanted it to be? Well, when we took over, 
there was a pretty severe insect infestation that was killing a lot of the timber. And we went and jumped in immediately and did a salvage operation. And now we've got a beautiful longleaf forest. We took out the dying and diseased trees. The other thing that we were surprised about was the amount of um, invasive and exotic plants on the property. You know, when you get a pre-bid tour of 12,000 acres, you get a little bit of a snapshot. Mm -hmm. But as we've learned the property and worked on it, there's a lot more out there and a lot more work to be done. Um, it's a beautiful piece of property. It's gorgeous. Thank you for paying us to work on it. You're welcome. Thank and, you for and, being you know, here today. We're working with different groups. Now we have security challenges sometimes. Mm -hmm. People want to, people are people, so they'll want to sneak on there, particularly during hunting season <laughs> and things like that. But we work through those, so I don't want it to all sound rosy, but um, you know, we just get after it and work on it every day. Thank you for doing that. Uh huh. Any other questions? Commissioner Seal. Um, just, uh, I, they've explained the need for this, but this is a quite a bit of an additional money, mm. um, especially when you bid the contract, it was actually going to save us money of about 35000 a year, and that included a contingency of $300,000 over five years. So I'm assuming you already spent the contingency? Well, we don't spend a dollar without staff authorization. Let's just be clear about that. Mm -hmm. So if staff wants us to do something, we will do it. Now, I do want to point out that we've raised money through palmetto berry sales, pine straw sales, timber sales. In fact, of the money you've spent today, that the money that came through the forestry company, we've returned 94% of that in income, but it doesn't get 94%, 94%, but it doesn't get credited to this contract. Mm -hmm. It goes in, into your county budget, wherever money goes. So we feel like we've done a good job. We uh, have run into some unforeseen things, you know, you've got some aging infrastructure out there. We've had to do additional road work. We've had to do additional work on the few structures that are out there. And then we've done some proactive things like fertilize the, the pine stand to accelerate the growth that sequesters more carbon, produces more pine straw, and will eventually produce more timber. <coughs> and I know you're not in the timber production business, but I can tell you enjoy the pine trees <laughs> because uh, the pines we grow in Florida in South Georgia. They're used in your lipstick to make it apply. Oh my. Yes, you <laughs> rub pine trees on every day. Your shampoo, your toothpaste, if you take time release medicine, that comes from our pine trees. So all kinds of products oh, okay. are used by consumers. And so not just traditional lumber and paper. So anyhow, fertilization is something that does, it's an expense today, but it doesn't pay off. It pays over the next 20 years, but you don't realize it till that far off. And when your staff ask us to take a financial look at what will this cost or what will it do in force management, because it is long-term, you do net present value, take future cash flows, a discount rate, and discount it back to today's dollars. So I don't want you to think you're just having to prop up a bunch of over expenditures, but some of it's just been, there was more um, catch up work to do than anticipated. And some of it's an investment in tomorrow's forest. And the forests we're planting today, they grow 24% faster than the forests we cut. So mm -hmm. we feel like we got a good story to tell. We just need you to come out so we can <laughs> tell it to you. <laughs> Commissioner Gerard. I just wanted to thank you for saving the gopher tortoises. <laughs> well, we like doing when I, that. When my assistant and I went to visit and take the tour, we were traumatized because there were dead tortoises everywhere. And mm. you, could you see them? Yes. <laughs> they had some sort of respiratory thing yes. or something. And, but, and that can yeah, happen. It was awful. We have a, a lot of gophers out there. And our firm, we, we just in the past year wrote two plans for the Game Commission lands to increase, uh, to improve the habitat on their gopher tortoise sites. So we like doing that, uh, but there is a risk with it. You know, it's just like the pine trees that got a disease. And 
you had some mortality. Um, we hope the legislature works with everyone to encourage gopher tortoise recipient sites. Mm. However, there's a bill up there right now okay. where because there's such a demand, they would open up all state-owned properties that are 40 acres or larger. Well, when you expand supply, guess that, what that does to the price of a recipient gopher. Right. So we're, gonna, we're monitoring that legislation <coughs> to see how it might impact you going forward. Mm. But right now we're just trying to restore habitat. Restoring habitat is an expensive thing to do. Just no ifs, ands, or buts. There's no income coming off of it short term. <coughs> All right. Thank you. Ms. Ross, did you have anything to add? Hi, Megan Ross, Director of Utilities for Pinellas County. Yeah, I was going to say thank you, Mr. Curtis. You took the words right out of my mouth. Um, he, he summed it up pretty well. We've been doing a lot of work, and as he stated, some of those investments that are going to be spent as part of this change order um, involve future revenue generating pursuits such as the fertilization and planting additional pine trees. Megan, do you have a question about the changes in the funding that contract for next month? Yeah, so the this change order, the additional funds will include an additional contingency. I think it's about twenty percent. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> to get us through the end of the contract term. Further questions, discussion or is there a motion? Move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Long, second by Commissioner Gerard Clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. <coughs> and it passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Curtis, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Item 24, County Attorney. Under item number 24, I am asking for your authority to file suit in the referenced case. This is a matter that was investigated by your Office of Human Rights, uh, who did find cause in a housing discrimination case. Move second. Motion by Commissioner Peters, second by Commissioner Long. And the clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. Passes unanimously. Item 25. Item 25 is a similar case, also investigated by your Office of Human Rights, where we are uh, likewise asking for authority to file suit in a case alleging housing discrimination. Move approval. Mm -hmm. Second. Motion by Commissioner Peters, second by Commissioner Gerard. Clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. And it passes unanimously. Item 26. Under item number 26, I'm uh, requesting that you adopt the resolution that is provided for in your materials, which will delegate uh, to the tax collector and direct him to make notice of delinquent uh, uh, taxes. Move for approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Peters, second by Commissioner Long. The clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. And it passes unanimously. Item 27, County Attorney Reports. Yes, and our, uh, I just wanted to bring to everyone's attention, you may have seen there was a very brief article uh, related to, again, the Crossbar Albar Ranch. Um, as you all are familiar with, we uh, have had litigation with the Pasco County property appraiser and tax collector, to be clear, it has not been with Pasco County, uh, related to the county's payment of taxes, ad valorem taxes on that property. Uh, we did litigate late, litigate that, uh, did not get a favorable opinion from the second district court of appeal, which is our district that we reside in here in Pinellas County. And given some of the language in that case, we thought it important to pursue an appeal to the Florida Supreme Court. Uh, taxation issues for political subdivisions like the county are intertwined with our sovereign immunity. And we felt that some of the language related to our sovereign immunity was a bit alarming in that case, and therefore we did uh, file a petition with the Florida Supreme Court asking them to take jurisdiction. Now, we filed that back in 2019, uh, so you all haven't heard a lot about this case until just now, but just yesterday we were informed by the Supreme Court that they will be taking jurisdiction on that case. That's something discretionary for them, uh, so they did agree to take jurisdiction. Uh, so I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Um, we're going to be meeting with uh, the county administrator and his staff to make sure that we're proceeding forward uh, in the best manner because I think we have worked through a lot of things with Pasco County in partnership on that property up there. But again, our concerns really re relate more to the sovereign immunity issue, which mm -hmm. again is intertwined with the tax issue. 
Uh, so we have a pretty short brief schedule. We'll be filing a brief within the next 30 days or so, unless for some reason we get an extension. Not to say this is going to be decided quickly, but you know this will play out in the courts. But I did want to bring that to your attention. And if anybody has any questions, I would invite you to give me a call. All right. Thank you very much. Item 28, County Administrator Reports. Um, just a quick update. Um, our case percent positivity has come down significantly. It's down to 10.23% over the last seven days. <laughs> Um, so again, we're seeing that trend down. I think that's because everybody's got it. But um, the but you know, as as you're seeing that, you're also going to see some changes with our testing sites. Private sector can handle that. Um, so the um, the state antibody um, um, infusion center closed the 25th of January. Um, you've got the um, center for healthy St. Pete um, closed effective um, January 31st. Uh, Tropicana Fields will be closing <coughs> February 20th today, and then um, we have our site that will close at the um, end of March. Is that correct? March 25th. And so then that will be pushed back out to the private sector. So that's all I have. Very good. Thank you, sir. Item 29, appointment to the Feather Sound Community Services District by Commissioner Eggers. Yep, just uh, had a couple folks that I said I had interviewed out there, both really good candidates, and I'm, I'm, I'm moving forward with uh, Nick Pfeiffer as my choice, and so I just uh, move approval on that. Second. Motion by Commissioner Egger, second by Commissioner Gerard. Clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. It passes unanimously 6 nothing. All right, item number 30, County Commission New Business timely updates. Commissioner Flowers, we'll just start down here. <laughs> um, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. First, um, just to give a report about our T-Barter meeting that we had on last Friday. Um, unfortunately, we did not have a quorum, um, and that was due to a representative from the city of St. Petersburg had an unexpected illness, and so they were not able to attend to give us a quorum, but we did have an opportunity to talk about a number of things to include additional um, rapid transit utilizing the um, shoulders of the road versus not when we um, get over into the Hillsborough um, area, there's still some contention, unfortunately, with some of the residents and whatnot over there. Um, but I believe that the Secretary for Transportation and Commissioner Long, correct me if I'm wrong, <coughs> Um, he and uh, one of his colleagues did share with us the difference between um, any permission we needed to ascertain from DOT versus permission we needed to ascertain from Hillsboro. And so that was made very clear that what we were discussing as it relates to extending that rapid transit corridor, we could receive permission from the Department of Transportation and still make it happen. So, um, um, didn't I have a chance to welcome the new mayor from the city of St. Pete, so hopefully he will be at the next meeting. Um, we also, um, I also wanted to um, just share, I could not share prior to, um, but unfortunately, for me, I'm saying unfortunately, we did have the resignation um, of um, the executive director from Career Source. Um, I just want to clarify some information that was put out there that was incorrect. Ms. Bragney did not resign because there was any issue related to inappropriate expenditures of dollars or stealing money, as some have indicated. Um, there was a form that should have been uploaded to the DEO site, and that form was not uploaded. That is not a felony offense or a misdemeanor offense. She did immediately upload the document. The document was one such that simply stated what the salaries were for leadership of career source. She did resign um, after a conversation that she had, not with me, but that she had with others. Um, there was a emergency meeting that was called for Friday, which was the same day of the housing conference that I was sponsoring, and I was not able to attend that meeting. It was called quite quickly, but um, it's my understanding based on that meeting that the board members did accept her letter of resignation. Some of you may have already um, read the articles in the paper. The chief financial officer is serving as the interim, um, and so there will be a search for a new executive director. I am hopeful 
that the board will really take its time in interviewing and trying to um, support the correct person to lead. Um, the roles that Career Source has is not an easy one. You're talking about working with persons, some of them who are very hard to hire, and then managing them through a 180-day period and so forth and so on. And the state has what they call the Red and Green Report. It still exists. Um, and um, unfortunately, if you don't meet certain parameters, you get that red. Everybody wants the green. Um, but um, Career Source still has three areas that it received. Um, uh, areas where it did not meet its goal last go round, and they're not going to meet the goals in those areas this go round. I think a lot of it has to do with COVID because the mobility of individuals um, was somewhat diminished over a period of time. And then as shops began to open back up, people then began to have more job opportunities that were made available for them. Um, but um, many of us wish Ms. Brackney well in her new endeavors, whatever those new endeavors are. And we certainly wish the very best for the gentleman who um, will be taking over in that stead. Uh, for the housing um, conference that was held, I was just very excited. Thank you to my colleagues that were able to make it and for those that um, gave their verbal support. I hope you all received the swag bags um, <laughs> that I, I wanted to make sure I had set aside for you. But I was just very pleased. A number of developers and contractors attended, a number of community individuals attended a lot of great ideas um, the individual I had to video the breakout sessions and whatnot he's still putting that together because I want to make sure that it's clear it's clean and it's sl um, slices off so you can see what the session is and you can determine if you want to fast forward or not so um, he and I've had a chance to meet all the photos um, I have them on a drive I'll make them available for anyone that wants them um, but the video will be put out and it'll be uploaded on the YouTube channel so you can go back and watch any pieces, bits, or components that you desire to. The final panel discussion um, on the last day I thought was very beneficial, mm -hmm. talking about some of the barriers and then talking about solutions to some of the barriers as it relates to building affordable. So I just want to thank everybody. I want to thank um, Mr. Tom Almonte and his staff um, for putting on a wonderful session that dealt with financing, the, con the creative ways to finance a project, um, something that we've talked about here consistently. You shouldn't come to the county and just think that the county is going to give you all the money you need to build, you should maybe go to a city and have that same interpretation. But look at how you can marry a number of resources so that we're not building five units or 10 units, but we're doing 61 units or 87, 91 or more units. So I was really excited about that. So thank you so much um, for having Regions Bank and, and um, the Florida Housing Finance Corps, thank you, President. They were really excited. Um, drove all the way in from Tallahassee and then turned around and drove right back. So thank you all so very much for that. I really appreciate it. The uh, Homeless Leadership Alliance um, is moving forward. Um, I truly believe that Amy Foss is doing a wonderful job mm -hmm. leading that organization and coming up with some real creative ways as it relates to how to help people and get them off the street. And certainly um, her staff, she's hired a young lady who her specific task is working with veterans who are homeless. She herself is a veteran, mm -hmm. and so she really is putting a lot of her personal self into um, making those connections. So I'm really excited about that, but they continue to do a real, real good job. So thank you so very much. Um, serving on the um, Pinellas Community Foundation. Thank you, Jewel, for providing some advice to Doug and Cooley as it relates to my continued um, ability to serve on that board. I am not serving as an appointee of Pinellas County Government. I'm serving on the Board of Governors, and the Board of Governors appointed me. So I'm really glad that they um, support and, and feel that I'm worthy to be on that board for the work that we do. And um, again, Jewel, thank you so very much for providing that advice to Doug and Cooley and the rest of the team. Um, and that's all I have. I know that's a lot, but that's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I did have a question for our county attorney, and if you're not ready to give us an answer, we had rewritten the interlocal agreement with um, Career Source to specifically address our role in the hiring and firing of an executive director 
Does that apply to the interim? And can you kind of guide us on what our role will be going forward? Yes, I do believe that it does apply to the interim. And my understanding is that you all will see an agenda item to that effect mm -hmm. at your next meeting. Um, when we rewrote the interlocal, and it wasn't just the interlocal agreement, it was the bylaws that were adopted by the Career Source Board, and then also, you know, I'll call by action of the board blessed by this board. Um, we did give ourselves the county as the chief elected official, I think is the term under uh, the Workforce Act. Um, I wouldn't say greater authority because we always had the authority, but I'd say a more natural entry into the process um, by way of, you know, a, a selection committee that is set up for both the chief executive officer or the, or the executive director, I should say, and the legal counsel. Um, as you recall, those were two positions in particular uh, that we were troubled by with some of the activity that we saw a few years back. So we do have Commissioner Flowers, who of course is the board's appointee to the Career Source Board, is automatically on that committee, as is your staff appointee to that board. So we have two folks uh, that are specifically called out to be on that committee. Um, and then the selections ha really have to be approved by the Board of County Commissioners. So yes, we have a greater entry into that process and you will see some um, action in regard to the interim, but then most certainly um, any future selection as to a um, executive director. And Mr. Chair, we did, um, when I say we, I mean career source, did its legal, which is, which is Ms. Marchman, there was continued conversation and dialogue and questions to make sure that the process was being followed and to assure or determine if the county commission needed to um, perform an action as it related to Ms. Brackney's letter of resignation and for the interim and any processes going forward. And um, Don and Jewel provided uh, counsel, if you will, as it relates to where the county commission's role stood. Um, and I wanted to make sure everything was done decent and in order, so yes. <laughs> All right, very good. Commissioner Long. I, I have a very brief update from the Regional Planning Council. Our climate summit, second annual climate summit, is still on target for April 5th and 6th, and I'm hopeful that between now and then you'll get an agenda for it. It's, it's looking like it's going to be every bit as good as the last one, so I... I hope some of you will decide to participate. And that's the end of my report. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Gerard. I just want to thank Commissioner Flowers for putting together that affordable housing conference. I think that was really valuable, but just having all those people together and throwing ideas around and, you know, hearing what different aspect or different parties had to say was really interesting. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Seal. And I agree, and the theme was streamlining yeah. <laughs> government. So um, we had our forward Pinellas meeting on February 9th, and basically um, the most important item was still looking towards zero fatalities and serious injuries. Um, we still have an increase in pedestrian and bicyclist um, injuries and deaths, and so um, Commissioner Eggers actually said we should increase the utilization of speed feedback signs, and Mr. Blanton was going to work on that. Dr. Cynthia Johnson presented to us on the private sector perspective, and um, that um, looked at the Alt-19 corridor, so um, <coughs> other than that, there wasn't anything. There was an amendment in Tarpon Springs. Um, to allow a use of a property as a medical office, but other than that, there wasn't too much that transpired at that meeting. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Peters, did you have anything? No, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, um, I have a few things. Um, one, first of all, my, my term as chair of Tampa Bay Water um, sadly ended. Um, it's a two-year opportunity, and I can tell you that I absolutely thoroughly enjoyed the opportunity to to meet with staff frequently, to meet with other stakeholders around the uh, the region. I really believe in the regional model that's there, as it, it, it's been successful over 20 years of bringing together the counties and the major cities uh, to talk about bringing the most precious asset that we have to people's homes. Um, we um, obviously have a number of issues that are coming forward. Uh, uh, Commissioner Oakley from uh, from Pasco County will become the new chair. Um, and Commissioner Smith from Hillsborough will be the new vice chair. Um, 
But issues of uh, water supply, we're, we're working on a new water supply project this year. Uh, will be decided by the end of the year. Um, water quality, all the standards of federal standards are met, but we're, e we're looking at a water quality supply project that I think will be, will step it up even further and benefit <coughs> Pinellas County specifically since we do get a lot of well water for our residents here. So that water uh, quality improvement will be beneficial. Uh, continue to look at uh, reclaimed use by each of the member governments that are part of that or uh, part of Tampa Bay Water and what each community is doing with it. It's just amazing how different we use that precious resource. Um, and one minute it has zero value and then when we're negotiating for uh, uh, using the product and uh, one member government all of a sudden has that looked at as gold. <coughs> Uh, as far as getting uh, compensation from Tampa Bay Water. So we, we still struggle through different issues, um, but nonetheless, I think that the, 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 the acrimony has been reduced tremendously over the last few years, and uh, the, the new leadership at Tampa Bay Water is doing well. Uh, just publicly wanted, I did it yesterday, or did it on Monday, but wanted to thank uh, Tampa Bay Water staff, but also our own utility staff who uh, engages with the two members who represent you, Commissioner Peters and myself, but also weigh in on many of the discussions on the issues that I just talked about. Um, so they're, they're a, a critical component. That's been a big change, that our utility people are at the table on every issue so that there's is a real good collaboration going before it even gets to the board. So I, I'm really, really excited about that um, and uh, encourage that. Uh, uh, there's a lady that spoke to us today, second item, uh, about pace uh, on, the, on the commercial construction. Um, I do think, and I assume we're going to be looking at that again. On the, we've got, we've not used it at all. Um, we we all agreed that it was a good thing, but we are not using it. And I think a lot of it has to do with the reality of. I mean, she spoke to it today, but the reality of paying construction projects as you go, which is what every other construction project, known to man, does. So you do some accomplishment, you get signed off on it, you get some compensation for what you've accomplished to that date. This does not allow for that. So um, if, we're, if we're not going to do it, I think we've talked about that before, then we need to get rid of it. Um, and if we're going to do it, then we think we need to get creative on how we can bring that to the table. So just a, a side comment. The last thing I want to talk about today, I did bring it up last time with you all, um, about term limits. Um, and I have... Um, just in perspective, I, I just wanted to make sure that, uh, first of all, I appreciate the fact that, that I have the opportunity to talk about, I think, something that is extremely important to residents around this county. Um, the speakers today, uh, many of them touched on things, and I think just, you know, uh, items like nonpartisan, items like let the voters vote, Legitis legitimacy will be gained in some people's minds. Uh, seven or eight of people of 10 support it nationwide and probably a larger number today. Uh, fresher and better ideas, maybe fresh ideas and some better, maybe not some as good, but nonetheless, bold and brave move. I thought there was some good comments about uh, George Washington. Give voters a voice uh, by somebody. Again, nonpartisan. The idea of mentoring others to step up and do jobs that uh, we have, we, we obviously, all of us as public servants uh, truly enjoy doing. Um, and then referendum, just to allow people to vote. Let it be their choice to vote. I like Aiden Barnes talking about um, Frederick Douglass, uh, bringing him up as far as being true to myself. He also has some interesting uh, discussion about messaging and the message being important, but the messaging being even more important. Um, Eight-year term limits bring more effective governance. That was a, an opinion. I'm not sure about that one. But nonetheless, there was a lot of people that weighed in on the rationale behind term limits. And um, I, I don't think, I think all of you know those term limits. And um, so I thought because there is now a, 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 a petition that has been uh, formed, um, and there will be an effort uh, that's going on countywide that we at least take one more shot. Um, I, mean, I want to take the baseball analogy of three strikes and you're out, but um, I do think it's something that we ought to think about because, again, the residents did do this Herculean task some 25 years ago uh, when they got the, the number of votes that needed to be, or the number of signatures that needed to be accomplished to be on the ballot. 
Um, and then court cases moved forward into the early 2012, 13 time frame that basically, and I'm not going to get into all the legal things, but it basically said that that effort probably, if it had come forward at that time, probably would not have been thrown out. I think that the effort's been there, the, the people have spoken, and, and I think, you know, it would, it would be our way of saying, look, uh, you don't need to go through that Herculean task again. Um, we, know, we know you've spoken. We know the trend nationwide in the state of Florida has, has, been, that, has been that way. I did spot, speak to um, um, a gentleman, uh, Commissioner Tory Alston from Broward County. He's a recent appointee by Governor DeSantis to the commission there, and I asked him about his perspective. He had, he's lived there for a number of years. He was there when the, the, their three terms, or 12 years, uh, was put into place. Um, he sees it as a very positive use of it, and, it, and, and I think he said, <laughs> and we have to get away from it for four years. Um, and so I think it gives a chance for people. There's a lot of dimensions to the job, and as time has evolved, I, went, I was supportive of, of eight years at the city level when, I, when we talked about it uh, during our um, uh, Charter Review Commission. I said it's important that this Charter Review Commission discuss it. I did not, I said it could be two, could be three terms, I was unsure. I feel pretty confident that, you know, my, from my perspective, that 12 years is probably the right number. And then your, your four years um, hiatus from the board is a, is a clean break and a chance for others to come into play. Um, I, you know, for, to have the opportunity to serve the residents like we have, the blessings that we've been given, the opportunities that we've been given to help each other out. Um, and, and, you know, again, if, if the will of the commission uh, is more receptive to what the residents were asking for predominantly, some people asked for term limits, consideration of term limits. Some people were very specific about eight years. And if the will of this commission is to do that, I certainly would not, uh, I would be supportive of that. My motion would be to to move forward to a commission meeting to talk about, again, a agendize the discussion as soon as possible to allow for term limits uh, in Pinellas County, go on a referendum in September, and, um, and give the voters a chance to do that. And, you know, again, my proposal hasn't really changed. I've brought it up twice now. It's three, four-year terms, um, and then you're away for four years. Um, I don't want to get into all the details, but there's a transition phase for the commissioners that are here, but essentially finishing the term you're in plus one more term. The one that's on the table from the citizens is plus two more terms. So I think this way it gets it's, but a minimum of three terms for everybody. So um, we can get into those details, but the idea would be that we consider three, four-year terms for our residents and um, for them to have that opportunity to vote <coughs> for term limits in, in November. And I would make that motion to bring it to a commission meeting to get into the details of, of, that, of that proposal. I would second that motion. All right, we have a motion and a second. Further discussion or questions? All right, remember, uh, just to refresh where we were last fall, Commissioner Eggers brought forth this idea where we had uh, the language on the agenda item for the 12 years with the restrictions that are there. Um, at the one meeting, I think there was, uh, there was not a second on the motion to go forward. Uh, the next meeting, and maybe correct me, the next meeting we talked about it but didn't have a motion on it. Um, both, in, both in workshops. Both in workshops to bring forward to a commission meeting. Um, we heard discussion today. We heard a lot of uh, citizens' opinions. Um, a lot of those were opinions were uh, intertwined with what they described as facts but were completely inaccurate. Um, not all. Not all, but some of the folks that said Commissioner so and so had been serving since so and so, what a particular date, it was inaccurate. Um, some of the other things were completely inaccurate. <coughs> some of the reasons they brought forward were items that were before other governmental boards, not this board. Um, but that, that, that notwithstanding, we do have a, uh, you will need five members, if we get to an agreed upon language, you will need five members of the commission to vote yes to put it on the ballot. So today, we need a simple majority to bring it back as a, a, a discussion item. And then most likely we would need another meeting after that to have finalized language unless there was five members that supported the whatever language Commissioner Eggers brings forward at that time. 
Yeah, and I, just again, one more thing is that, again, 12 years is my sense of what is the right amount for a commissioner to get their their job finished um, in, a, in a timely fashion. Um, you know, again, uh, again, thinking, that's my primary <coughs> thing, but thinking that it would be slightly more palatable to you all for consideration um, versus the, the folks that continue to think that eight years is enough, and I'm not saying that they're wrong, I'm just saying that, you know, at least the conversation uh, to have that dialogue, I think, is healthy, and it's the right thing to do. And again, um, this will, you know, again, be the last time that I bring it forward, but I, I think you all, you know, I think the, the reasons and the rationale behind it are clear, uh, they're simple, they're straightforward, they are democratic, they are nonpartisan, they are about doing what is right for our residents, giving them a chance to vote on an item that many, many, many of them feel very strongly about. So I'll leave it at that. And to be clear, the yours would include some time served, <laughs> some time served as a, <laughs> um, of commissioners before, so potentially it would be committed this term and one more, whereas the citizen initiative that's out there, my understanding would be this term, whatever current term the commissioner is in, plus two terms. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So there's a, there's, a, there's a piece on the 8 versus 12, and then there's the piece on the transition. So, so both of those would have to be dealt with. And if it goes on a workshop, it can be discussed and changed and morphed into other things. So <coughs> I, 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 think, I, I think it really warrants some real deep dive into this. I think there have been two ballot questions that have, you know, have been done on term limits, and um, I think I think that people deserve an opportunity to have a voice. We're supposed to represent them, and clearly the ones that are coming to speak feel like we aren't representing them on this issue, and I think it deserves a good discussion, a deep dive, but we haven't been able to have that discussion because we can't get a second or, or nobody wants to vote to at least have the conversation. Um, and I think it's warrants. I think it's worthy to have a conversation, and, uh, and there is nothing wrong, in my opinion, in letting people have a voice and a vote. I, I mean... <laughs> That's the kind of government we are. We're supposed to represent them, but there is nothing wrong with letting them have a vote. So I, I hope you all would consider just a workshop to discuss it, take a deep dive. Um, I think that we could really come up with a good solution um, that we work on together that could be really best for all and the future people that would serving than, than have uh, you know a ballot that somebody else put together that we have no say in. Mr. Chair. The oh, uh, Commissioner Flowers, go ahead. Jewel, did this commission take a stand as it relates to placing on the ballot um, information related to Amendment 4 for persons to be able to have the right to vote, for felons to be able to I have the right to vote? I do not recall this commission taking a stance on that. Yeah. When was the last time this commission took a stand, such as being what's being asked, so that because really, the group, they can get it on the ballot themselves. It may be a little bit more arguous, but they had nothing to do with us. They had to do with the rule change in Tallahassee as it relates to the threshold. Um, but they're able to get it on the ballot. They don't need us to get it on the ballot if that's what they decide. When was the last time this commission supported an effort such that the, and placed something on the ballot that the constituents came forth and asked for. If you're talking about term limits. Votes period, a <laughs> referendum, <laughs> referendum period. I want to say that some years back, this commission did place um, a question on the ballot that amended your charter that added some protections for your environmental lands. Mm -hmm. um, that's been, and I, I, I see Commissioner it. Seal nodding. Um, it's been some time, but that's an F, that is something this commission voted to place to referendum to amend our charter. For term limits, this commission never actually put anything on the ballot. Back in the 90s, well, and, and Commissioner Seal, I'll, I'll let you defer, because even when this question came forward, I've been with the county attorney's office for over 25 years. I was not with the county attorney's office. Um, when that item was placed on the agenda. So you'll have to forgive some of my history, but I know that the question that you all are familiar with that came <coughs> forward from the Eight is Enough pack back, and I believe it was on the ballot in 96, um, that was done by Citizens Initiative. And I know that your charter review commissions 
have discussed this issue over the years and declined to bring forward um, a ballot question. And I just thank you for clarifying that. I, the only thing I know about that is, of course, what I read in the newspaper because I wasn't on the county commission at the time, but I uh, worked with a number of outside organizations, um, several of which did not support term limits. So that's, and it has nothing to do with my party. And I just want to say for the record, just because persons don't come here and speak doesn't mean that there aren't people who um, feel a different way than the persons who come and speak. Um, I will say that, um, and, and persons can come and they can ask whatever it is that they desire to ask, but I, I appreciate the positive comments that were, uh, repeated that some of the speakers made, but they also made some kind of hard ones as well, comparing individuals to Marxism and, uh, living in worlds and countries where persons are not free and where there's not an opportunity to select individuals. I've run for office before and actually lost. Um, and I had been elected before, but I actually lost because the people spoke and they selected someone else. That person was Nancy Bostock, who served up here with you guys. Mm -hmm. So I've been um, on the winning end of a campaign. I've been on the not-so-positive winning end of a campaign. Mm -hmm. And I also just want to correct for the record, the young lady stated that Congress has term limits and the Senate has term limits. That's incorrect. Um, and just to give an example, Mitch McConnell has served in the Senate since 1985. That's 37 years. Nancy Pelosi has served in the House since 1987. That's 35 years. John Larson has served since 1999. And Steny Hoyer has served since 1981. So um, just, you know, when you're framing issues or you're framing points of view, I just want to make sure that persons understand that the Con United States Congress and the United States Senate does not have term limits. There are other institutions that don't have term limits. I understand that they are constitutional officers, but our sheriff officers, property appraiser, tax collector, supervisor of elections, um, state attorney, public defender, uh, they don't have term limits. Those individuals, um, our state attorney who has passed away, um, I had a good relationship with him, but he served for a number of years. Um, Mr. Dillinger, who retired from the Public Defender's Office, served for a number of years. <clears throat> good relationship with him, was able to speak and talk with him about different things that were occurring within the community and see how we could help on a number of issues, and he was very open about that. Our sheriff, Sheriff Bob Gualtieri, he and I have an open relationship. And, um, you know, he has his positions, and then he um, has his differences. So. Um, you know, it may not be popular with those who who uh, support aid is enough, um, but I do believe that persons have an opportunity to be elected out of office if that is the desire of the community, and that has been done both in our community on state level um, and also on national levels. Um, AOC actually beat out somebody who was an incumbent and in line for leadership. Why? because she was talking to the people about the things that they felt were important to them. Um, so just wanted to share, you know, we're all entitled to our opinions. We're all entitled to feeling the way that we feel. We're all entitled to vote the way that we want to vote. Um, but uh, I do know that if eight is enough, if the group eight is enough would like it on the ballot, they have an opportunity to get it on the ballot the way that um, Desmond Mead and others um, had to get their items on the ballot, which was to go through the process, which they're going through, and to go out and to communicate with the voters and, um, and allow people to vote. And if individuals vote the way they did before, then that's what will happen. If they choose to vote in a, a different vein, that's what will happen. Um, so those are my comments. Thank, thank you, you Commissioner. Chair. Commissioner Long. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, but you will answer my question, so I have no further anything to say. All right. Um, and, and, you know, I, there's plenty of organizations in Pinellas, local governments that have term limits, and they function incredibly well. Um, I don't think term limits are evil. I don't think they're in, incessantly bad. I don't believe that they are the panacea, which we heard from some of the speakers today, that it will cure the issues of 
uh, some of the problems that are in, in politics. The emails that we've received that had a laundry list of uh, complaints about government, uh, I hope they're sharing those emails and those concerns with the Florida legislature as they are the ones that control election law in Florida. We do not control a single election law in Florida. So if you, if you think that an election law, and I quote, has been perverted uh, to benefit uh, a particular group or individual, uh, I would encourage you to communicate your thoughts and desires with the Florida legislature on that issue. Um, I want to be clear about what the motion is because Commissioner Peters mentioned a workshop. Commissioner Eggers mentioned agenda, uh, an item on agenda. If Commissioner Eggers, uh, you have the yeah, floor. Yeah, my, my motion was to bring it to a commission meeting only because of, of, the, of the time that's going to be needed to get to get this work done. And, and we don't have a second meeting. I would be glad to take it to a workshop in, in, in March and then go to the second meeting in March, but I don't think we have a, two meetings in March, so we're, we're skipping until... Gosh, I want to say the first or second week of April, and um, and I just would like to be if, if if we're going to do it, then I'd like to be able to hold, you know, head that off at the pass and 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 the residents' efforts that is has started and and underway. Um, just a couple of comments. Uh, one is that I think Greenlight Pinellas was a referendum uh, that the commission allowed onto the. Onto the, onto it the it is, and that, and I was only sticking to those that we had placed that would amend the charter. But you're right; Understand. that is, that is a referendum. Yeah. The we we have taken those actions, and just for the record, also we have three ways to, to put items on. Ref and this is, you know, Jewel counseling me on this, and I think we're all pretty aware of it. One is by a petition from the residents, which they've done once. Uh, one, secondly, is to do it through our our uh, charter review commission which didn't even hear the issue. They listened to people test, do testimony and, then, and had a motion to put it on the floor for discussion, and it was not seconded. So our... our oh, there you our, go. And then the, th and then the third, a, a mostly point, appointed by us, a reflection of us, and that's fine. I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying that's what it is. And the third way is for us to do our jobs. Uh, that is a, an option. So, you know, I just want to make sure it's not out of the... Norm, it's not out of the question for us to, to do it ourselves. Um, I'm just saying that, you know, um, there are there are three ways to do that. So not just not just one way. Uh, the constitutional. Somebody made comments about the con they're completely different. They're elected people, but they are true professionals that are li living a life in their own profession. It's in some way, most of them that come to bear for our residents. Um, and to and to expect them to stay eight years with pulling them out of the middle of an election or m middle of a career would be un unwarranted. And I think they have uh, several more than just three people that report to them, uh, as w which is what we have. So, um, and I too wanted to second the comment that was made. That, that generally speaking, really appreciate the professional approach and the comments that the folks made today. Clearly impassioned about what they believe in, um, and, I, and I really appreciate them coming out. Um, and again, the discussion is what we're, we're talking about having giving the residents an option on something that they've already done and had it taken away. So anyway, that, I, I, enough. I'm not going to go on any, any further. I've, I've asked for that to be put on. So My motion is we, to bring it to the next commission and I, meeting. And I second his motion. Okay, very good. I, I just, again, wanted to be clear because uh, the idea of term limits is one thing, and for a conversation, a workshop, or but I'm not sure we don't have specific language in front of us. Nope. And so I don't know what that would look, if it's exactly like before, that's different than if we're talking about it with, as Commissioner Peters said, a, a deep dive into it to talk about different options on term limits. Those are very different conversations. One is set in stone, the previous uh, item that you presented, or a discussion on all type of options on term limits. Well, I, my, my purpose in bringing it to the commission was from a time standpoint that, you know, we're going to get, and if we can get it, if we can get it on, if, if that's not of interest to everybody, but there is interest in having a deep dive discussion at a workshop, I would be willing to amend my motion to, to do that. Um, but I'd certainly like to see, um, before I take that motion off the table, somebody else amend that motion and, and to have a supportive approach to a workshop where we can actually have some good discussion about the different <coughs> options that may be available to us. I have not seen that action, so I'm not, I'm not really wanting to take it off the table at this point unless I hear an amendment from somebody that's not the two of us that would be willing to bring it for uh, a, a discussion, time sensitive, in March. If, if I could just suggest something to add to the conversation here. 
um, for you all to put this on the ballot, you would need to adopt an ordinance, which would have to be properly advertised for at least 10 days. I know that you all are familiar with that process. <coughs> so even bringing this back to the March meeting, you're not going to accomplish this at that time. So just to put that out there for you all for a time frame reference, maybe you do have time to bring it to a workshop, but I just want to mention that you could bring it to the next commission meeting in March, but you could not adopt an ordinance at that time. You would still have to bring it back to another action meeting in order to do that. Of course, with an ordinance being written and drafted and you know you all having an opportunity, but more importantly, properly noticed to take action. And that, that ordinance would include the ballot language? That is correct. Okay. It would include both the ballot language that would appear on the ballot and also the language that would be inserted into the charter as an amendment. Okay, Commissioner Long, did you have something? I was just gonna ask for the question to be called since we've been talking for the last right. 15 minutes. We have a motion, we have a second. The clerk will unlock the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. Is it number 30? Commissioner Flowers? Um, check, is this the right thing? Yeah. Item 30? Yeah. New business. This is item 30, I just wanna make sure. The item fails four to three. All right, we are adjourned until 6 p.m.
Good everyone. Good evening. Good evening. We'll call our public hearing portion of the meeting to order. Item number 31, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Agenda item number 31 is a proposed Tax Equity Fiscal Responsibility Act resolution for issuance by the Pinellas County Educational Facilities Authority of its revenue bonds in an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $7 million. This is on behalf of Learning Independence for Tomorrow Incorporated, which is doing business as Lyft Academy. The public hearing was properly advertised and affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received and the matter is properly before the authority to be heard. Is there wishes for a uh, presentation of any kind or? No. Nope. All right, we have one uh, public speaker. I don't know if they're just here for questions. Uh, Brooke Gonzalez from Bryant Miller Olive. Yes, sir, I'm just here for questions. All right, thank you very much. If there's no questions, discussions, is there a motion? Move for approval. Second. second. <laughs> we have a motion from Commissioner Flowers, second from Commissioner Gerard. The clerk will open the board. Second. Commissioners will proceed to vote. <laughs> You're gonna kill me. Just for you, my friend. <laughs> By the end of the year. <laughs> And it passes unanimously. Item 32. Oh. Adam Clerk. All right, agenda item number 32 is case number uh, ZON 21 08. This is a request by Pinellas <laughs> County for a zoning change from RMH, which is Residential Mobile Manufactured Home, to R5CO, which is Urban Commercial Conditional Overlay. Since this is a quasi-judicial hearing, all those individuals who plan to speak on this item must be sworn in. So for those of you who are wishing to speak, if you could please raise your right hand, whether you're attending in person or virtually, and do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing about, but the truth, if so, signify by saying I do. <coughs> the public hearing was properly advertised, and affidavit of publication has been received for filing. Uh, one letter of opposition has been received, and the matter is properly before the board to be heard. All right, I have no cards. Um, do the commissioners wish to see a presentation? Nope. Nope. Anyone else from the public wishing to testify? We'll close the public hearing. Wishes of the board. Well, Motion by good. Commissioner Gerard, second by Commissioner Long. The clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. And it passes unanimously. Item 33. Agenda item number 33 is case number ZON-21-12. This is a request by First Capital Trust LLC for a zoning change from RA, which is residential agriculture, to R5, which is urban residential. This is also a quasi-judicial hearing, so all those individuals who plan to speak on this item must be sworn in, whether they are attending virtually or in person. Uh, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, signify by saying, I do. All right. The public hearing was properly advertised. An affidavit of publication has been received for filing. Five letters of opposition have been received, and the matter is properly before the board to be heard. <coughs> All right. We do have some commenters on this, so maybe we can get a brief uh, staff presentation. Good evening, Glenn Bailey, Zoning Manager. In this case, the subject property is approximately 2.3 acres. It's on the west side of Starkey Road, approximately 500 feet north of 94th Avenue, uh, north and unincorporated Seminole area. It's a requested zoning atlas change from residential agriculture to urban residential from R8 to R5. And the future land use, there is no change to that being requested. It is currently institutional, which allows 12 and a half residential units per acre maximum. The existing use is a vacant parcel. It was once part of the church to the south, and the church sold this land off um, a couple years ago or last year. It's been recent times. A proposed use of the 29-unit townhome rental development. You see an aerial of such a property. See, it's, it's currently vacant. However, again, it used to be part of the church to the south. It used to have a playground on a couple of structures. To the north is a 42-unit uh, condo um, townhome community. And above that is a 48-unit condo community. And to the south, again, it's a church. There's also, they're also approved for a preschool. To the west are large lots, uh, single-family subdivisions, uh, single-family lots. They're zoned RA. And to the east is single-family homes, zoned R3, and also the Bardmore development, which has um, many more condos along Bardmore Boulevard. And there's a bank to the north of that. See, let's, see, let's go back. The existing zoning, see the, the brown is the RA, and that's on the left. 
And to the right is the proposed zoning R5. You see there's a lot of RPD, residential plan development area. That's the condos to the north, townhomes to the north, and the Bardmore development to the northeast. And the, uh, the yellow colors are the single family, 6,000 square foot single family uh, zoning R3 developments. Um, and the RR is uh, kind of in between the RA and the, and the R3. So you have a mixture of development in the area. But along Starkey Road, which is a four-lane divided arterial, you have more of the multifamily and quasi-commercial uses there. We see a closer-up aerial of the property outlined in red, uh, the church to the south, and uh, again, the townhome community to the north, the condo community north of that, and the large lot single-family homes to the west. <coughs> This is looking at the subject property from Starkey Road. See the church playground on the, on the left side of the picture, and the condo, uh, the townhome community is on the right side past uh, the tree line buffer. It's looking north and south along Starkey Road in the area. This is a lighted intersection up there at the Bardmore Boulevard. The current RA zoning allows, uh, would allow one residential unit on the property because it requires a minimum lot size of two acres. It also allows other agricultural uses, uh, personal agricultural uses, um, like courses, things like that. I propose R5 zoning would allow for a maximum of 29 residential units with the institutional feature land use map uh, category, which will again allows 12 and a half units per acre. It has flexibility with building orientation and setbacks. It would be, would be a compatible design with the properties to the north and the other condos and townhomes in the area. And multifamily development in, on this property would require a type 2 use review by the Board of Adjustment following the rezoning if they're successful. The proposed zoning guidance change. Uh, the surrounding area contains a mix of low and medium density residential uses. Again, it's sandwiched between uh, a townhome condo community to the north and a church to the south, and it's along the four-lane divided arterial roadway, Starkey Road. It's consistent with the comprehensive plan. Development Review Committee recommends approval, and the local planning agency recommended approval uh, on a unanimous vote. So if you have any questions. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Other questions? Uh, Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, just real quickly, uh, so townhome um, that's two stories, three stories, is there a limitation on height here? So there are five limitations, I believe it's 45 feet. 45 feet, so three stories probably, <coughs> as opposed right. to condos that would be, could be considerably higher. Correct. So as you said, it's comparable to the property to the north. Correct. R5 only allows six unit buildings, so you can't have more than six units in one building. Further questions? All right. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. We have uh, the applicant, the owner rep, um, Justina Gale. Yes. Is that Good right? evening. Yes, Justina you, Gale. You'll have up to 20 minutes to make your presentation. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. Justina Gale, Florida Design Consultants, 20525 Amberfield Drive, Land Lakes, Florida. And as stated in the staff report, um, it is consistent. The proposed rezoning is consistent with the comprehensive plan. It is also consistent and compatible with the surrounding land uses. Just adjacent to the north, there are townhomes. Um, my client is proposing to do very high quality, high end um, 29 townhome units. Um, and then the, we'll, we are also proposing to do enhanced landscape buffers. Um, he has met with the surrounding um, owners. Um, we received a letter from the church to the south that support the project. He has also met with the townhome associations and some of the um, townhome owners to the north, and they also support the project. So do you have any questions? I'd be happy to answer. Questions them. for the applicant? Just one. Mr. Gerard. So you say he met with the single-family homes to the west? Um, I know he's running a little bit late, but he okay. has met with a couple of the owners, yes. And it, so, it was stated in the email, I think he sent to um, staff. Were the letters of opposition from people on the West? I haven't received anywhere? or seen the letters of opposition, okay. but I, I believe so, yes. I and he's met so. with a few and reached out. I can answer that, yes. There's opposition from, <coughs> from the East, mainly from the East. From the East. The uh, property. West. Yeah. From the west, sorry. West. Thank you. Um, they do about one property to the west, mm -hmm. and then there was some other correspondence with properties further west than that. There was also some concerns at LPA from the townhomes neighbor to the north regarding things like drainage, 
uh, you know, lighting, things like that, that's uh, dealt with at site plan review. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, Commissioner Eggers. And, and you talked about buffering. Uh, we're talking about buffering to the west. I mean, we're going to be bu doing an enhanced buffer around the whole entire property, and um, we'll propose a fencing. Um, like I said, this is going to be very high quality, so he'll do some very nice um, above and beyond what code requires. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. All right, you'll have about 19 minutes should you want at the end. <laughs> Uh, we do have a couple other. Folks. All right. Um, we're going to. I don't have anyone else in the room that has filled out a card to testify. Uh, we'll go to our online participants. Uh, Mr. Charlie Delator, if you raise your hand in the Zoom application, we will unmute you. Or you're going to have to unmute on your end. Mr. Delatore, you need to unmute in your Zoom function there. All right, we'll come back to you and give you one more shot in a second. Uh, he was listed as undecided. Uh, we have another one, Robert Brass. I don't know if that's our second one on the Zoom. Mr. Brass, if you're on Zoom, if you'd raise your hand in the Zoom function. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, there's Mr. Delatore. Yes, sir. You'll have three minutes, sir. Mr. Delator, go ahead. I see you. No, it's I see his name lit up and it's unmuted. And we heard him for a second there. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. Can you hear us? I guess that's. Can you hear me, Lynn? Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Hello? Yes, Mr. Delator, we can hear you. Can you hear me? <clears throat> I think we're going to have to move on. I don't, he's not hearing us. We're not able to get him to move on. He did. Um, in our correspondence, his opposition is noted. Okay. He was opposed then. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, he lives at 9121 94th Avenue near the project. Uh, on the Zoom application, he listed as undecided, but thank you for bringing that up. Um, I can't, I, I, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Hi, this is Charlie Delator. I, I apologize. Um, been having technical difficulties. Anyway, my property is directly adjacent to this uh, zoning request. I met with uh, uh, Robert uh, Chiskin, and I really appreciate him coming over. All right. Well, they're erased. <laughs> Got to get to sixteen in three minutes. What do you want to do? Well, we're we're not hearing him, so we're going to move on. Okay. And I did not see. Uh, anyone else raise their hand in the Zoom function? Mr. Again, Mr. Brass, who also lives at 94th Avenue, his position was against. You saw on your agenda item there were correspondence uh, on the project. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties that we had. Um, the applicant, uh, you still have some time. Do you want to add anything, or are you are you fine? I'm good, thank you. Okay. We're going to close the public hearing. Wishes of the board. No approval. <clears throat> and 
I did want to say that I drove around the property and there's some really deep ditches there. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd tell Commissioner Akers about that. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a motion by Commissioner Long, a second by Commissioner Seal. Further discussion? Uh, the clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. And the item passes unanimously. <coughs> item 34, Madam Clerk. Agenda item number 34 is a proposed ordinance amending the Pinellas County Code by adding Article 7 to Chapter 126 that provides regulation pertaining to private sewer laterals, and it also provides permitting and regulation of private sanitary sewer collection systems. The public hearing was properly advertised and affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. Before we take public comment, uh, do the commissioners wish to see a any more uh, presentation on this? Yes. All right. We'll have uh, Ms. Ross come forward and give us a presentation. Good evening, Commissioners. Megan Ross, Utilities Director for Pinellas County. Before we get started today, I would like to show a brief animated video that you've seen before that was developed as part of our public outreach strategy that demonstrates how damaged private laterals can lead to increased inflow and infiltration, which contributes to sewer overflows in our system. So with that being said, let's cue the video. A common threat to everyone's water quality is inflow and infiltration, also known as I&I. &I. Let's start with how sewer systems actually function. Each homeowner resides on the private side of any public sewer system utility. When you flush your toilet, take a shower, or wash your dishes, you create wastewater which flows from your home into a pipe called a private lateral. This private lateral connects to the public sewer system at the edge of your property and is maintained by your city or county. Wastewater flows from the public sewer system to a treatment facility designed to handle a specific volume where pollutants and bacteria are removed. When rainwater falls, it's known as stormwater. Stormwater percolates into the soil, increasing groundwater level as well as storm drain levels in the street. This stormwater eventually flows into creeks, lakes, Tampa Bay, and even the Gulf of Mexico, just as it's designed to do. Stormwater and wastewater flow into separate systems and should never be mixed together. So, what about INI? INI happens when a private lateral breaks or is damaged by tree roots or old age, which allows the groundwater table to then flow into the pipe, also known as infiltration. High levels of INI in the public and private wastewater collection system often lead to sanitary sewer overflows, or SSOs, which again, threaten our overall water quality. It's alarming to learn that up to 70% of stormwater entering the sewer system is due to damaged laterals. Though your indoor plumbing may be working fine, your aging lateral underground can be a different story. In areas with high groundwater tables, sealing the public system portion may not be enough. Thus, most private lateral portions need to also be repaired to reduce infiltration into the system. With wastewater being harmful to human health and the environment, homeowners should have their private lateral inspected, repaired, or replaced by a licensed plumber to keep it functioning properly. Keeping your sewer pipes healthy will keep Tampa Bay healthy too. For more information, visit the Pinellas County Utilities website. Put a lot of effort into that video. Picture's worth a thousand words, right? right? So just to provide some background and context as to the overarching purpose behind the policy before you today, the Wastewater Stormwater Task Force, which was formed in 2016, <coughs> had developed a strategic action plan aimed to reduce or eliminate sanitary sewer overflows in our collection system. One of the action plan items was the development of policies that would address inflow and infiltration into the private portions of the sewer system. And today we're pleased to say that we have prepared a policy before you today for adoption that we believe is both effective and practical at addressing this issue. We have been working with our wastewater collection program consultant, Wade Trem, on developing a detailed private sewer lateral ordinance and policy aligned with the direction provided by the board 
at work sessions both in May and December. So to emphasize the importance and rationale behind this policy, I'd like to recap the issue at hand. A sanitary sewer overflow is an overflow of raw or untreated wastewater from the sewer system. Sanitary sewer overflows can impact public health, water quality, and the environment. There are two overarching issues driving the need for this private sewer lateral and private system policy today. The first issue is that Pinellas County continues to see sanitary sewer overflows during heavy rain events due to the inflow and infiltration entering the system. The photo on the left with the red dots reflects the highest volume of sanitary sewer overflows over an eight year <coughs> period. Reducing inflow and infiltration at the source before it gets downstream is the most cost effective strategy to eliminating sanitary sewer overflows. The increased flow entering the sewer system will make its way to one of our two wastewater treatment plants that are already at their capacity and would require far more uh, costly plant expansions. The second issue driving this policy is that our largest wastewater treatment plant, the South Cross Bayou Advanced Water Reclamation Facility, is under a consent order, meaning it's uh, at the early stages of a potentially more intense and regulatory enforcement process. So this private policy is aimed at reducing the risks of further regulatory enforcement to Pinellas County Utilities. As a reminder, the policy components before you today include a rebate, a permitting component, find and fix, and private sewer systems. Today we're recommending the adoption of the policy through a resolution coupled with amended ordinance language. The find and fix program will achieve significant inflow and infiltration reduction because it focuses on remediating specific areas in the system that are already known sources of inflow and infiltration. The goal of this program is to reduce this inflow and infiltration from private sewer laterals as part of ongoing sewer main lining rehabilitation programs. So all work in this component will be led and funded by Pinellas County Utilities in conjunction with our ongoing capital improvement program. Megan, question. Um, you said already known. How, how, how is that already known? How, is that, so how are these areas already known? Yeah, so we have been conducting uh, various inflow and infiltration monitoring over the past few years, and that's essentially placing flow monitors at strategic locations throughout the collection system. <laughs> And through that process, you can identify areas where there's both inflow or infiltration or both, and to what quantities of each exist. So through that process, this is the fruition of it. We've identified key areas that we need to hone in on and focus on for improvements. And I noticed these red areas. So are we, um, are we is there something consistent, like age of home or... Is there anything consistent that you've noticed in, 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 in all of these areas? Well, yes. I mean, typically you're going to see your older aged home areas are where you're going to find the cracked sewer pipes where water is, is intruding. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank I you. mean, there's other factors like soil conditions can cause a more a corrosive environment, but typically age is, is a huge factor. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so these are the priority areas shown on the map, and the largest areas include areas in Leoman and along Seminole Boulevard. These were chosen, like I said, based on some of the data that we've achieved, age of the system, and SSO data in other areas. Um, we also have areas here on Bryan Dairy Road and Starkey Road. So our analysis has found that utilizing this approach to target private laterals in these areas can reduce inflow and infiltra infiltration downstream up to 25 to 55%. So this is a significant reduction and is consistent with other um, similar programs throughout the United States. As we continue to evaluate the sewer system, we expect to identify other areas that can be prioritized within our capital improvement program. And the estimated costs for the program are shown on this slide. Uh, these are the same costs that we presented in <coughs> December. Nothing's changed. Uh, this also includes one full-time equivalent employee that we would be requesting through the budget process to manage the temporary easement or right of uh, entry process to the private homes. 
The permitting program applies to sewer capacity related property improvements requiring a building permit. So this would prompt an inspection and corrective action if it is needed. The goal of this program is to require the property owner to inspect and repair the sewer lateral when home improvements occur that can impact the sewer system. The policy outlines the specific improvements that would require an inspection. The improvements that will require this type of inspection are anything that requires additional plumbing fixtures that would add capacity, improvements that exceed 50% of the home's appraised value, a new addition to the home that's equal or greater than 70 square feet, and a home that is fully demolished and rebuilt. So the cost for this program would also include one FTE for permitting support and um, some other additional costs as seen on the slide. So the rebate program, this provides customers with funding for inspection and corrective action of their private lateral. The goal of this program is to incentivize property owners to inspect, repair, or replace their own private laterals. And again, this can be combined with the permitting option. This is done by providing a rebate of up to 100% of the inspection cost itself, um, which is up to a maximum of $350. And then, if needed, up to 50% for the repair or replacement cost uh, with a maximum cap of $3,500 that we would provide. The program costs are also shown on this slide. Uh, we would need one FTE here to you know, issue the funds and maintain the program. And on the private systems program, the areas um, that have larger private collection systems, these are typically commercial areas, strip malls and other types of um, communities. These systems uh, contain potentially collection systems, manholes, lift stations, uh, force mains that are all privately owned. So this would involve uh, permitting and inspection of the private systems to ensure compliance with local and state regulations for operation and maintenance. And again, these are systems that are connected to our sewer system. The goal of the program is to ensure that these connected systems are not contributing to the inflow and infiltration in our public sewer collection systems. And again, the program costs um, are shown on this slide. <coughs> And that concludes the presentation for tonight, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Further questions? Commissioner Eggers. Um, and these are all annual costs that we, that we just got, right? Yes. And all of these costs are, are, are going into our sewer fund? Are coming? Yes, from, that's so, correct. And is that the area that we saw the biggest increase in our utilities, the water versus the sewer this past year? Yes, we did see an increase on the sewer side. Yeah, there's a lot of work on the sewer side in the capital program. And you said that one of the reasons we're doing this is to save costs uh, on the consent order. Like, uh, uh, what would, I mean, we're talking about six million, six and a half million a year. Yeah. So it's yeah. going to take several years to get this done. Right. What's that compared to it, roughly in, in, in terms of, compared so to you know, improving that? If we were to look at it from a perspective of, um, building additional capacity in the system versus mm -hmm. going in and correcting the pipes, um, we're, we're seeing this is significantly less okay. um, than having to go in and build huge tanks and buy property, and which I don't even know where we would right. find the property to do so. But in terms of the consent order, we are getting fined every month for every SSO that we're getting, and that can be anywhere from fifteen to $30,000 a month. So it's significant by comparison, but it's also yeah. fixing a problem that we have. Mm -hmm. a, a exactly. Serious, I think serious environmental issue, environmental problem, as well as really property values for individual residents. Right. Um, this, is, this is a major thing if you're having sewer. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Gerard. So when you do your public outreach about the private laterals, Will you be able to tell people what they should look for to see if they have a problem um, in their lateral? I mean, short of getting it inspected, obviously. Yeah, it, it, it is difficult to do that without, right. you know, um, getting an inspection. I mean, what we've done in the policies, we have actually defined what a defective lateral is, which I think up until this point, hmm. there is no clear right. definition for plumbers. I mean, I know when I call a plumber and there's a blockage, they clear the blockage or they move on, okay? So, <laughs> you know, we've defined, you know, tree roots, cracks, anything that can cause the INI, we've actually spelled it out here. And so the plan is that when they get the inspection, 
they'll all be, it'll be apples to apples. So we'll be looking at getting, um, you know, inspectors to go in and do that cool. and identify those. So what is an inspection cost? Can't say I've ever had one. It, right now on the market, it can be anywhere between 250 to $350 okay. for a camera inspection. Mm. Cool. Yeah. Right. So we'll yeah. rebate most of that. Yeah, we're looking at rebating 100% um, of that cost. And on a private lateral, can you, if there's nothing seriously wrong, can you um, line the pipe like we do with our Yes, arbor? absolutely. Right. So we have included a lining option in the policy because, a re like you said, a full replacement can be quite costly. So we've allowed for a lining option, and we've spelled out, you know, what that means in terms of the testing to ensure that the lining is has the integrity. Cool. Yeah. Right. And thank yeah. you to whoever kicked on the air conditioning in the back room. <laughs> Commissioner Peters. Hi, I, um, you know, I really, I support this and I'm, I like it. I like the, the commercial aspect because you'd be surprised when you start inspecting. We had in, in, uh, in my city, we had a commercial business that didn't like his parking lot flooding. So he made a drain and directly connected it to the sewer system. Mm. Oh my right. goodness. Thank you. Oh and it wasn't the stormwater <laughs> system, it was the sewer system. And even after we gigged mm -hmm. him on it, he, after we watched him, he did it again. And so we had to permanently seal it on him. And so I'm really glad you're doing it because you're going to find more than just that one yeah. uh -huh. um, who's done stuff like that. And so, so I'm glad you're going to do the inspections on the private and, you know, in the big commercial, because I think you're going to find yeah. a lot of things that are going to be disturbing. Um, and so thank you very much. And, um, and, and if you don't get the notices um, for SSOs, uh, sign up for them, because you're going to be surprised how many times South Cross shows up for SSOs. And so I'm really glad we're doing this. And thank you for all your hard work. Thank you. Further questions of staff? Right. And thank you, Commissioner Justice, because you chaired the That's right. task force. Thank you very much. It's long, long time coming, so. <laughs> very long. We do have one uh, member of the public that would like to comment on it, uh, David okay. Ballard Geddes, Jr. Come forward. You'll have three minutes to address the board. Hi, good evening. David Ballard Geddes, Jr. I live on Georgia Avenue in, in Palm Harbor. Um, I was just uh, kind of thumbing through this on, on uh, the web page. And this ordinance 22 dash, and it doesn't really kind of finish off this ordinance, but it goes on to say in that ordinance um, about a private plumbing infrastructure belonging to a property owner, which is not the county, and as a private facility collection, there will be a fee interest system involved. So this private lateral is not a homeowner's possession anymore. This uh, plumbing underneath my home now belongs to not me as a homeowner, but to a private uh, operation that has the capacity to um, collect an annual surveillance charge as recognized in Maloney's Water Code, Section 1.13, published in 1972. We got set up on this. Now, so all these homes that have been developed starting at 1972 up to today with infrastructure that was deliberately established, number one, to fail within a certain time period so that the government was able to re-navigate with this new plumbing process, um, why weren't the homes built up off the ground to allow easy access to the waterworks underneath our homes? Why weren't there um, easy slip-in and slip-out um, caverns built underneath our homes to you know, easily rebuild the plumbing underneath our homes? Um, and it seems in here there's a conveyance of such within this ordinance as well. That conveyance I found within uh, statute 253.141, and it's a property title transfer of such. So, in a sense, someone, like I said in my speech earlier, is reaching in and snaring the homeowner for additional charges regarding the plumbing process. Um, I don't believe Danny Burgess's bill uh, last year, uh, 1058, I think it was, yeah, 10, 1058, um, is anything more than like I had said, part of a, a long-standing carpet bagging process. Um, and uh, 
I, I think we, we do have some issues that need to be talked about um, as, a, as a homeowner. I don't feel as though legislation has the right to establish uh, long-standing, overarching, backbiting uh, charges against uh, you know the unwitted uh, uh, civilian population. Thank you. Thank you, David. I have no other cards. We will close the public hearing. Which is of the board? Move approval. Motion by Commissioner Gerard, second by Commissioner Long. Sorry. The clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. <coughs> and passes unanimously. Item 35. So, Mr. Chairman, this is a regular agenda item. It's a companion to agenda item number 34. Mr. Administrator. And this item is, uh, it authorizes me to establish the program for the private sewer laterals and the enforcement. I have no cards. Uh, wishes of the board. Move approval. Move approval. Motion by Commissioner Long, second by Commissioner Gerard. Clerk will open the board. Members will proceed to vote. And it passes unanimously. Item 36. Agenda item number 36 is a legislative petition to vacate. This was submitted by Mikhail A. Foken, Zilia Ruga, Hugo E. Gonzalez, Rosemary Craig Gonzalez, Kimball McNeil, and Mary McNeil. This is to vacate the 50-foot wide right-of-way of Palmetto Avenue lying east of Elm Street and west of Church Street. This item was continued from the January 11th meeting. Um, the public hearing was properly advertised. An affidavit of publication has been received for filing. Letters of no objection have been received with Spectrum advising that the petitioner would bear the expense of any required relocation of its facilities. All interested parties have been notified as to the date of the public hearing, and it's still just the two emails in opposition that have been received. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Administrator, kick so off. So my understanding, um, and the, the applicants are here, that uh, is your wish to withdraw this. There's been a lot of work between our staff, Safety Harbor, the applicants, and their attorney um, uh, with respect to this property. Welcome. Yes, sir. Come forward. Thank you. Uh, how are you doing? My husband was taking advantage of me <laughs> last time I spoke. So he said, she left I me 20 seconds, seconds last time. Yes, yeah, so I get to speak. I just want to, <laughs> I got the important job to thank you guys for working with us. And uh, we really, really appreciate uh, your hard work and uh, uh, taking time meeting with us in uh, person. Uh, Commissioner Eggers coming over to the property and actually uh, inspecting and uh, visiting and making sure that everything is done right and we're moving the right with the right path and uh, uh, Chairman Justice to make sure that we are uh, guided by the right people in this process and we understand what we're getting ourselves into. I uh, would like to, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, special thanks to uh, Blake Lines who is no longer with the county but uh, um, she did a lot of work on this. Jean Crossan, Evelyn Spencer, um, Layla, I will butcher her last name. Cardine, you know, Cardine, she's a supervisor of the Caridine. public. Cardine, yeah. So, and uh, Tom Almonte, he spearheaded all this uh, work between the city and the county. Uh, and uh, the funniest part is the plans were approved very, very close to our original submission. Mm. And that was really kind of hurtful that we spent all this time and, uh, you know, materials went up, the prices went up, labor went up, and uh, we pretty much we weren't in the wrong original when we submitted it. I think we just got uh, in um, political turbulence between the city and the county and the road transfers and everything, and we kind of got stuck into that. But I'm glad that with your help we were able to resolve it all. And the last thing is Brian Ongst. Uh, he would like uh, for you guys to know that he really appreciate your work with us and uh, with him and county staff. He appreciates the county staff and the county commissioners. That's it. I know there's not a lot of people coming in just say thank you uh, for, for your work and what you do. You're just kind of doing it on the background. But we just want to personally say thank you and we withdraw. We'd like to withdraw the application for uh, so application. So what do we need to do to do work out? Uh, we just got a permit. Okay. It's basically, the whole but through the county. Through the county. Through the yeah. Okay. Yeah. The you can whole do, you can idea <laughs> was just to build a house, and uh, we don't really care about the vacation. That would be nice to have, but 
honestly, the biggest thing was just to build a house. That's all we want to do. We didn't never wanted to get any land or anything. You can do it by a account. permit. Oh, uh, do it by a permit versus a vacation. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Which yeah, we all asked Very to good. Withdraw petition, and we will issue permits yesterday. Mm -hmm. And right. so we are keeping our part of agreement. County have their part of agreement. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. I'm gonna have my 20 yes. seconds. Now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 40 <laughs> seconds. Yeah. Good for Brian. Yes, I, I was just like to join my husband's words, Michael Swartz, about thanking everyone, each of you, for we felt your support and. For me, it's very amazing because we came from non-democracy country, and I'm just here, here, came early just to listen about having this opportunity to see how branches of government work actually in, very effectively. And when some other branch doesn't do something, so there is another branch to correct and to do it right. So to have a correct result for the people. And we feel your support. Um, just so excited just to be here and show this and say my appreciative to all of you and to county staff, to Tom, special thanks. He was very involved last week with us, so we became like we were in contact every day. And I want a special thank to Mr. Tom because I had opportunity to spend an amazing date night with my husband. Because on Tuesday afternoon, after speaking with county, we had a, oh, for our permit, we are missing habitat protection permit. So my husband just submitted application late afternoon. In two hours, he purchased all the items to build a fence. And it's 7 o'clock after I came back home, bringing kids, you know, making dinner. <laughs> we out there for the eight night, and we're putting fence around this <laughs> property. We stayed till 1 o'clock at night, and we've had a great time. So I'm very really <laughs> thankful, <laughs> County. Because I we got to do better on date night. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see my husband often. He's working, I'm working, and now, now this project will bring us <laughs> together more closely. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but again, thank and special thank to Brian August. He's amazing attorney. Yeah. I'm attorney myself. I'm baby attorney. I'm just you know step to this uh, journey, and I know now the standard to being a great attorney. He yeah. is absolutely amazing, and yeah. I'm very grateful to him. And he asked to uh, show his gratefulness for the all the support that he received from you too. Yeah. Thank you so much. And you did, and you did get the vacation, the the north south vacation, the little strip. Did that before? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was before. Yeah, mm -hmm. Good. we did that before. Well, congratulations! Can't wait thank to you. see thank your you house. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. all the neighbors for coming in yes. yes. December and showing support. We had yes. a thankful party yeah. for them on the end of right. December, so we gathered oh. together and it brought actually our small community together. That was and, uh, nice. Yes, Perfect. we are hoping we will be gathering more often. They're very nice people. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much Thank for being here. Guys. Just, uh, do we need to do anything formal to? It, with action, with the petition withdrawn, no action is needed. All right. Okay. Um, that is. Uh, that is the end of our agenda. I do want to share with you uh, one bit of news. Uh, I know several of us are interested in. Uh, there, uh, several of us have been filing, following election legislation in Tallahassee, and. There's a component that deals with single member commissioners and their reelection. Uh, the House had that language. The Senate did not have that language. Uh, the Senate bill will be up and there has been a strike all filed. Doesn't mean it will pass, but a strike all filed on that bill that does include the House language dealing with Pinellas County and single member elections. So FYI, um, and we can talk more about that later, I guess. With that, unless there's something for the good of the order, we are adjourned. Good night.